All right. Welcome to another episode of To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. Make sure you click that subscribe button down there. Give us a like, ring the bell, all that good stuff. Today, I am very excited to welcome my good friend, Mr. Brent Muscat on What's the podcast. What's happening? How's it going? <laughs> It's going great, man. I'm stoked to have you here. Thank you for having me. Oh, bro, thank you for coming on, man. Oh, it's great. I've been uh, I've been looking forward to having some of uh, my rock star buddies come yeah, on the nice, podcast. Nice studio. I like your studio here. It's awesome. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, awesome. we've been working really hard on it. All the good uh, acoustic treatments and everything, and you know, we got all the new equipment going, and I'm just yeah. really stoked. We finally got this thing polished and functioning well, and so now I can start inviting. Everybody on super yeah. famous people like Mr. Brent Muscat <laughs> on the podcast. So yeah, what you been doing, man? Uh, well, just gosh, for like last year, just been sort of you know staying in. You know, uh, we were uh, the Saints of Las Vegas. We were playing out about three times a week, and then last March they just shut everything down. Yeah. So since then, just kind of like. You know, I play in video games, you know. What video I, games you playing right now? I like one called PUBG. Oh, I love PUBG. Yeah. Do you play PUBG sometimes? I do, man. I was playing quite a bit. Do you play it on computer or or Xbox? Or I was an Xbox player. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, although okay. I am getting ready to switch up to a new PC build. Okay. My friends started streaming, doing yeah, like yeah. Twitch and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And so they're all on PC now. Okay, so. but do you still play then sometimes? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, cool. You got to let me know sometime I'll play I will, you. man. We'll have to, I'll have to get your gamer tag before yeah, you yeah, leave. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, we'll get on and play some PUBG for yeah, sure. Yeah, I love it, yeah. It's been a while since I got on. We were playing the Call of Duty uh, version of it as well. Yeah, yeah. That one was really that good. fun? Yeah, it was yeah. free. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, the PUBG was the classic. Yeah. I was playing... Um, let me think. You know, I, I'd watch my kids play a lot. I got two kids. Uh, my boy's 12, and he would play, like, Roblox and uh, just different stuff like that. What's the other? Minecraft. And um, and I watched him playing one called, uh, what was the one where you build stuff? It's like PUBG, but it's like a more kid kid, oh, kid type. Fortnite. Fortnite. That is so hard to play. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm not into the building stuff. Like, because yeah. you got to, like, build towers and fight people. So I and I and so I'd play Fortnite, but I would never build anything. I was always like, you know, hang, I'd hide underneath the buildings. I never would climb on top. <laughs> you know, I, I would never build anything. But um, I'd win those sometimes. But I, I like that. But then um, my daughter, who's fourteen, um, recommended PUBG. She's like, Dad, maybe you want to play PUBG because it's a little more adult. And the guns are more real and everything. I'm like, okay, let me check it out. And I started playing it. And um, I went and got headphones, you know, and like the mic. Oh, yeah, and, you got to uh, have it. You know, and it's great because you talk to people and you could coordinate. You know, and that's the really awesome. You know, if you get really good players. I'm not that good, but if I get really good players, I just kind of follow them, you know. Yeah. But um, it's fun. And like a lot of the players on there, you know, I would say I'm kind of new. And they would kind of teach me. You know, they would go do this or do that, you know, grab this gun, it's easier when you're a beginner. And so I've been having a lot of fun. I've been doing that a lot, you know. I get mad sometimes, you know, especially like, you know, these players that die first, then they criticize, they're watching you and criticizing you, <laughs> you know, like, you know. Oh, it's so rough. Especially like uh, you only get one life. So you play yeah, a little yeah, different. Yeah, yeah, you play different, yeah. But it's funny because I'm playing sometimes with like 20-year-olds, you know, I'm like 50, and I'm playing with 20-year-olds, and they don't know how old I am, but, yeah. you know, but they're, like, criticizing me, and I'm like, you know, it's always the ones that die first that have to be so critical, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm a conservative player, too. I'm like, yeah. I, I like to hide out. I'm not super, because I'm not that great at shooting yet, so I'm more, like, sneaking around and hiding and <laughs> camping out and waiting for somebody to come in the room with a shotgun, you know, <laughs> hit them. But uh, they, they get all mad, and I'm like, hey, you're the guys that ran off, I, you know. Yeah. You know, running into fire, running man. into what fire. You, you know, I'm in, I'm in cover. I'm in the circle, and you guys are off. Like, you know, I'm like, you know. But it's funny, you know. Oh yeah. But, you know. We would play. Uh, we would play, and my buddy Anthony would always just rush out for a motorcycle and completely ignore the mission, and then yeah. he's just hauling ass. 
But it was, uh, I remember one time he was doing backflips over these people that were camped oh, wow. out in the house. <laughs> they didn't know what the hell to think of it, you know? Yeah, he yeah, just yeah. keeps backflipping over the house yeah. and screwing around, and they're trying to kill him. And it's as they were distracted on him, we were able to sneak in behind him. Yeah, and then some of the stuff that happens in the game is just like, it's so incredible because you're just like, this is, it's like the most incredible video comes because some of the stuff that happens is just so wild, but like kind of natural, but just that you would never imagine, you know, one time I was driving in the car with like, I guess four guys and we're driving and there was a car following us, shooting at us and they blew out one of our tires. So we were still driving pretty fast. They shot one guy out. And so I'm hanging out the back. So we got three guys in there. I'm hanging out the back, and I was in the back seat hanging, shooting these guys so much, I didn't notice that my other, like, everybody in the car got shot out except me. Oh. <laughs> but but I was, but the car was still coasting but yeah. fast, and I'm going, drive, drive, drive. And the guy goes, I'm dead. <laughs> I'm, like, shooting out the back. I was so into it. And I'm like, drive, drive. I'm shooting, you know, and the guy goes, we're all dead. You're the only one alive. But I'm in the back seat, and I'm thinking yeah. there's still like a driver up front, uh, and I'm just shooting. But it's just some of the stuff that happens is so funny. You know, it's just like, it's yeah, it's a it's a great game. I mean, it's like, and I'm blown away because you know when I was growing up, you know what I mean? It's like they didn't have that uh, games like that. Oh you know no, what I mean it was like. And now it's just everything's, so, I mean, you can talk to, how, you know, have a team of four people and you're talking to everybody, you know, and it's just like, it's, it's really great. You know? it, it's almost like that's kind of the, what gaming's become. Like if there's not yeah. an online multiplayer version where you're, you're teaming up with your buddies, it's yeah. like, what's the point anymore? It's great though, but I mean, we never, I mean, to team up with your buddies and be able to communicate like that and stuff, we didn't have that when I was growing up. So for me, it was like, when I first got on and started doing it, I was like, this is freaking awesome. <laughs> you know oh, what yeah. I mean? So, yeah, I'm kind of addicted now to that. I've been doing that a lot, you know. But um, You get a chicken dinner yet? Oh, yeah, yeah, a few. Oh, yeah, yeah dude, yeah. champion. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I I was on the um, map with the, like, volcano, and um, I got to the end, and uh, and I was down below this hill, and I could just see these, like, kind of, like, it was like a row of, like, flowers, kind of a farm type thing. And it was like me and another guy, and I'm just like right on the edge of circle, and the circle's coming in on me. So I just I was prone all the way flat, and I just crawled, and I had my shotgun. I was just crawling, <laughs> and um, I just and I got up, and the guy flashbanged me, so I couldn't see anything. You know, he did the flashbang. All I saw was white, so I'm just like screw it, and I just started shooting straight, <laughs> just by sh shotgun. I knew he had to be somewhere in front of me. I couldn't see anything, but I was shooting, 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 and then boom, it said chicken dinner. Like oh. I won. And I was like just by like crawling up. Yeah. You know, the guy didn't know where I was because I was like in like the, all like the the foliage or whatever it was, but I was just crawling up and just shooting with the shotgun. But it was pretty funny because yeah, the guy flashbanged me, and I basically killed him. While I was totally blind, that's <laughs> just awesome. Like, totally blind, yeah. But it was, yeah, it's fun. What a great way to win, man. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, stuff like that happens like all the time. Really wild stuff happens. Um, just crazy stuff, you know. Yeah, you never know what's gonna go down on PUBG, man. It's yeah, just like total chaos. I mean, it's just total chaos, yeah. And just it's funny stuff. I went to one, another funny thing that happened to me is I um, I was in a car and one of my team members went down. So he's like, come res me. So I'm like driving the car really fast to res him. I ran right over, oh, killed, him, killed him, just ran him over. And the guy go, the guy was all mad. I'm like, sorry. That's I tried. Awful. I was just trying to get to you so fast. I just ran him right over. Jeez, you know? man. Yeah, that's happened more than once in uh, in our games as well, man. Just but yeah, it's, it's a really great game. I mean, I've been, uh, and I'll go on and I'll stream it on twitch too sometimes i'll you know my games oh uh, what's stuff. your twitch handle it's uh what is it i think it's just brent muscat is it yeah check that brent muscat i'll look it up too and uh i'll put it in and the my, description. my my handle for uh pubg is brent pm b-r-e-n-t p-m brent PM. PM. Yeah. And that's on, is that on uh, Xbox or yeah, is that I'm on, on? Like, well, that's, I think, a PUBG. You could probably find me on there. Oh, is that just a PUBG handle? Is I that think PC? it is. Yeah. It's my PUBG, but I play, the guys I play with, 
I play with Xbox people and the Sony PlayStation people. That's I think those ones could play together. Oh, okay, yeah, I they think. did cross platform yeah, finally. Yeah. Another cool yeah. advent that the video game industry finally yeah, gave us is yeah. cross platform play. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll make sure that's all down below too in the description so people can, uh, can oh, go yeah, find play. you. Yeah, and... go on there and play with me. You know? Yeah, that'd be awesome. I gotta st I gotta start doing a little bit of a Twitch live stream. I gotta yeah, get set fun. up, man. It's a lot of people have been fun. doing that. So but yeah, have you tried any of the VR stuff yet? What's VR stuff? The virtual reality no, gaming. No, it's probably awesome though, right? It's pretty cool, man. Well, I can't wait to when they get a, like a game like PUBG or one of the like a game like that with virtual. That's gonna be really awesome. Oh I mean, yeah. When you could actually get get in there, maybe that you can even buy like a a rifle that you could hold or something would be super awesome, you know. I actually have uh, the virtual reality out there. There's a pretty cool game that uses a rifle. Oh, really? That you can maneuver and all. Uh -huh. Yeah, if you have time afterwards, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll totally yeah, 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 hook yeah. it up for you. You can yeah, check it out, yeah. man. But I think, yeah, I think when they do like a game like PUBG, virtual reality, and if it looks good and they get the technology right, it's that's going to be like friggin' awesome. Oh, I mean, yeah. You know, it would be, be great. Yeah, the one they have out, I'm trying to think of the name. I can't think of it, but you're shooting the aliens. It's kind of like a Starship Trooper uh -huh, yeah, simulation. Yeah. But you can go in with the other people oh, and still cool. do co-op or versus. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of interesting when you're yeah. in a virtual reality simulation and, like, you move. And it's like, that's actually a person I'm playing with. It's, yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah. a representation of them, but it's not someone on a controller. Right, right, right. It makes it a little different. Yeah, that's going to be really cool. Yeah, I can't wait to, you know. I'm sure within a few years, they'll, you know, like PUBG will come out, or like a game like that will come out with a virtual reality, too. I wonder if they have any. I'll look it up online real quick. Battle Royale VR. Yeah, that Battle Royale style where like 100 people drop in. Yeah, and it's, it's just awesome. Winner take all. Man, that really changed gaming, man. There's a lot of people that, uh, that started making games like that. Yeah, it's really awesome. Yeah, I started with Fortnite, and then... Um, I was kind of just going, uh, like, some of the guns on there are just retarded, you know, they're just lame, you know? So I'm like, uh, but I like PUBG because it's all, like, realistic guns, you know? Oh, wow. No, there's a thing called, uh, there's a thing called Standout that's a VR battle royale. Oh, that's I cool. I have to download that. might have that. to check that out. Yeah, that'd be cool. There's a couple on here. Yeah, Standout looks like it says it's literally it's a PUBG clone. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that'd be cool. I might check it out. I wonder if it's on PlayStation or not. So you, I have the PlayStation you, VR. So setup. you you hook up the VR stuff on your PlayStation. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's mm -hmm. got like a camera above the TV, and then mm -hmm. the 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 headset has all these lights on it that syncs to it. Right. And uh, on all the controllers have lights that it it syncs to, so it kind of does pretty good motion control of right. all that. The newer ones though, um, like the Oculus Rift, uh -huh. those that that's what I would recommend getting. It's yeah. fantastic, and it does it with outward cameras where it scans the room. Oh, I see. And like when you turn it on, you can kind of see your interface, but it has like a grayed out camera representation of uh -huh. the room around you, which the the PlayStation and stuff that doesn't do that. Right. Uh, but. You can you can map out a square area on the floor and like that's your play area. So if you walk outside of it, it'll it'll let you know you're about right, to walk right. into your couch or whatever. Right. And it's it's way more intuitive and um, sensitive and like accurate. Oh, that's cool. the new the new Oculus Rift. Mm. I think is it it is that's it's amazing. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. It's totally worth it. I think it's yeah. like I think it's like four hundred bucks or something like right. that. And uh, f so much fun, wow. so much fun. But yeah, I got the I got the PlayStation one out in the living room. Yeah, we'll a, I got a ton of out. games for it, man. It's a blast, yeah. man. I really like. Uh, well, I have to ch check out the one you just mentioned. What you said? What's yeah, it called? Yeah, it's called uh, Standout. Standout. Standout VR. Yeah, and I'll just put a little flash on the screen here. You Standout. can see I can't click the video or you know. Right. They're jerks. It'd be yeah, whatever. But yeah, Standout Battle Royale. That looks wow. tight. I'm really excited about that. It looks like there's a four runner there or a four wheeler. That's cool. Yeah. Man, yeah, there's some cool stuff out there. Oh, yeah, the logo's even a PUBG logo. Jumping out of planes and everything like that. Oh, really? It's a, it's it's PUBG, man. Yeah, yeah. That's totally just PUBG on VR. Yeah, we're going to download that. Yeah. We're totally going to download that right after this. That's freaking awesome. So, yeah. So, yeah, doing that, and then uh, I was lucky I got to play a little bit during the whole lockdown they kind of would try to open back up i played on the strip a few times 
Um, so probably through the this last, tw- you know, last year in 2020, with the shows down in March, I probably would played every other month, maybe once a month, maybe if we got lucky. But they'd shut it down for a while. Then they tried to open it, you know, and then. What were you Shut getting away with, there. like private parties and stuff like uh, that? No, or? on the strip at um, th- well they 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 do it, they scale down. They wouldn't hold the whole band. They'd have me and Anthony as like an acoustic duo. Okay. So we did that, and uh, God, yeah, we did that a little bit through the summer at um, Carnival Court, and there was a piano bar in there by ca- uh, Carnival Court in oh, there. Yeah, I think inside what is it, Harrow's there. Uh, we did the piano bar sometimes, and um, so it was cool, you know. And, and uh, last night we played uh, Sand Dollar, and we got a show coming up at uh, Friday. I guess the fourth is that Friday. Uh, the fourth, fourth? yeah, up. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, we have a show at the Rockstar Bar. Oh, yeah, I've been working over at the Rocks. That's where yeah, I saw yeah, you yeah, last. Yeah, you guys yeah. were playing Rockstar Bar yeah, for you, your birthday. Yeah. Even. yeah. Happy birthday again. Oh, thank you. Yeah. But yeah, so we played last night. So we're playing a little bit. Um, but other than that, you know, yeah, it's just kind of like 2020 was just kind of, you know, took it <laughs> off, you know, and just, you know, I'm kind of a homebody anyways. You yeah. know, my family and my kids are too. So it was like, it wasn't that much of a difference, you know, <laughs> to, to stay home, you know. But, um, but it's good, you know, it's good that everything seems like opening back up, you know, so I'm happy about that. Yeah, yeah, I've been doing some shows, man. I've been over at, uh, like you're saying, Rockstar Bar right, right. on Vegas Boulevard. That's yeah. a cool little new spot. And yeah. then um, I started working over at uh, Area 15 now. Oh, cool. Which is amazing. They have bands and stuff over there? Yeah, I was wow. just working with a band um, called Stanley Avenue. They're just, you know, they're like pop, top 40s covers kind uh-huh. of thing, you know. And uh, they'll actually be on the podcast. I got them coming oh, cool. on. Who a books that over there? Uh, I'm not positive who's booking can it right now, out? but I can find yeah, out. Find yeah, out. I definitely no, hook I you guys up. Yeah, like to get in over there. It's t- it's amazing. Yeah. 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 So yeah, it's like a like a psychedelic paradise. Like, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, there, Disneyland yeah. for uh, hippies who like to yeah. take MDMA and shit. Yeah, yeah, it's a cool place. Yeah. So the when you're doing the bands, is it outdoors out in the back there, kind of? Yeah, the ones I'm stage. doing. Yeah, stage back there or something. Yeah, it's called uh, the Beer Garden, uh-huh. and uh, yeah, we got uh, you know little PA out there, oh, and cool. we just have live bands playing music for people drinking beer outside. That's cool. The inside's really where it's at, though. It's yeah, cracking. Yeah. Uh, they have bands they have, inside too. Well, they have DJs and stuff inside, oh, okay. and it is, man, yeah. it's a freaking party. The, yeah, yeah. the lighting crew is amazing, and the projection crew is amazing. So yeah. everything's all 3D mapped on the walls. That's and cool. Yeah. Lasers everywhere and fantastic yeah. lighting. My brother's like one of the head audio guys over there. Oh, cool. And I've been going over there and helping him with audio stuff oh, nice. now. And, uh, and so the audio is just freaking banging, man. Yeah. I mean, it's all Myers stuff, and so it sounds really great in That's there. That's cool. Yeah, it's totally worth yeah. it. Yeah, we got to go and check out. Um, it was like Meow Wolf uh-huh. and a bunch of other little. I haven't seen them. Yeah, I work for the actual venue, so uh-huh. it's all offshoots and stuff. But there's some crazy stuff in there that's oh, just. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, you like take some mushies or something and go <laughs> yeah, yeah, wander yeah. around and trip out for a little while. Right. It's totally designed for that. Yeah, uh, we're gonna go check it out soon, man. That's when cool. I have a day off. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun, man. A lot of fun. See, I was checking out. Uh, I was checking out your uh, Wikipedia page uh-huh. and the band I was. I was talking to you before we got on the Alley Cats band. Yeah, yeah. I that never was... heard that. <clears throat> God, we did. I did that. It was like a project. I have a friend uh, that lives in Japan. He's half Japanese and half American guy, and he um, he lives in Japan. And he was sort of he put the band together, and. Um, Originally, it was Slim Jim Phantom from the Stray Cats, and then it was this Japanese guitar f- player from a band called Cats and Boots, and then me from Faster Pussycat. So it was like yeah. all these guys from these cat band names, you know. <laughs> and so they just called the Alley. We just called the Alley Cats, and then um, originally I was we were going to get Phil Lewis as a singer, but he kind of freaked out and got real weird and like started like yelling at the Japanese guy like, oh, you're trying to use my good name to get famous in America. And, <laughs> and the guy's like, what? It's like, uh, and he just got real weird. And then, um, so we got Zach Throne. 
amazing singer. Yeah, he started singing and playing bass in the band, and we made some records and um, went to Japan a couple times. Um, and it was funny because um, Phil, Phil Lewis had called me. He's like, so, said something to me like, why aren't you taking me to Japan? I'm like, I'm like, dude, don't you remember the email you wrote the Japanese guy? You're like cursed him out and (laughs) and he was speaking for me too he's like brent and i i'm like hey dude i'm like don't speak for me i'd like to do this project and go to japan you know and and but i go don't you remember you got real nasty with the guy through emails and he goes oops i guess i put my foot in my mouth that was phil (laughs) but no we did that for a bit and then um the Japanese guy, a guitar player, guitar player guy, and he's got a big. He was he's real famous in Japan. He's got a band called Seiki Matsu, and um, is that Takashi? Takashi, yeah, yeah. He's a really great songwriter, great musician, but he's a little too like um, too, almost too serious for rock and roll. You know, it's like. Uh. It's like he treats it like he's working for like a you know like it's rocket science or something you know. Oh I mean? God! And it just takes the fun out of a little bit and um, yeah. And yeah, it just got to be like even Zach was like we were over there in Japan. Zach goes, "What's up with Takashi, man? What's up his ass?" You know, and I go, "I don't know. He's just you know he." It's just not fun, you know. One of these guys is just like not, just makes it not fun, you know. I'm like, we're doing this is rock and roll. It's got to have some. It's good to be serious, you know. But yeah. it's like, God, I remember going over the second trip. He made a. We're like, we're like, we have like jet lag from just flying, and he gets us over there, and we're like rehearsing like twelve hours, like the day on like a day off, like the one. Our first day over there, it's like no time. 12 to, hours. It was nuts. And it was like, and he was real nitpicky. And it was like, you know when you get so tired and you're working so hard that it, at some point it becomes unproductive unprod- and you're just burnt out and you're just, you start making mistakes because you're so tired? Yeah. So it, it got to be like that. And he'd be like, that's wrong. We got to go over the song again. I'm just like, Jesus <laughs> Christ. You know? So it got to be really like just not fun and he you know we, and we're in japan so we want to have a little time off and yeah. we, you know, and we want to party with the girls and we want to drink and he's just like no fun it's just like you know total like they call it, i guess cock blocking you know yeah just where exactly it's like, you know like he's like the type of dude you know he would come in like if you're talking to chicks he'd be like hey you got a girlfriend, you you know, we got to play tomorrow. Got, you know, just oh, like, come on. just not fun. It was just got to be like, you know, I even fought with him one night. I remember coming off stage and just like yelling at him because it was just like, fuck you, dude. It's like, you know, it's just like not, this is not. And so his mentality, I think it's a Japanese thing. They like to do everything perfectly. But at the same time, he's kind of doing you know, rock and roll is kind of an American invention. You know, it's yeah. almost like you're doing something American, but you're trying to do it in a Japanese way too much, where it's like just too strict. So I mean, I remember Zach was just going, "I'm not coming back," and I'm like, "Fuck! If you're not coming back, I mean, I'm not going to do this with another." He's a singer mm-hmm. already. We made like a couple records with Zach. I'm like, I'm not. The Takashi's not fun, and if you're not coming back. It's going to be really... <laughs> That's not yeah. fun. What's yeah, the point, yeah, yeah. right? I mean, so, it's called playing for a reason. Yeah, and it was too bad because the, the records we made were really great. And like I said, Takashi, he's a fantastic guitar player and he's a fantastic songwriter, but he's just a little bit like takes the fun out of it. You know, he's missing that little, that rock and roll part. Yeah. You know, he's missing the idea. Somehow there's a little ingredient that's missing. You know what I mean? It's like. Yeah, just reckless you know. abandon, man. Yeah, you know, yeah. You're supposed to you just know. be partying and having it's like drug, sex, and rock and roll. Exactly. You're not, you're not playing music. You know, and the thing about music. rock is that even if you're a little loose, the more you play as a band, you're going to get tighter. And it, it, yeah. It's going to happen. You don't have to force it, you know? 
I'm all for rehearsing, but there's a point, like I said, when you start rehearsing and it's like 10 hours and you're just like, it's the 11th hour, you know, 10th, 10th hour. And you're just like, your fingers are like sore. You just like, who can play for that long? It's just dumb, you know? And, um, or he'd get us up in the morning. We'd go to sound check like early in the morning. I haven't even had my barely had breakfast or even coffee yet. So you're getting on stage and there's techs over there, so your guitar is set up. But you get on stage, you're not even wake woke up yet, and then you make a mistake, and he fucking curses at me, <laughs> like. Oh. And it's one thing if somebody goes fuck, but when they when they kind of go motherfucker, like directed at you. Yeah. If they're just mad, but if they but when they direct it at you, and somehow super inappropriate. I would have rather him cursed in Japanese because somehow when he, when a Japanese guy curses in English, somehow for me it sounds <laughs> twice as bad as if an English because <laughs> it's kind of like they're they're cursing but they've got the, they're like almost saying it wrong. Yeah. But it's just like you don't know, maybe because you're Japanese and you're using these American curse words, you don't know the, the deep feeling hurt you're cut you know that you can do to someone you know so i remember just go fuck this guy i was just like you're gonna fucking t- say fuck you to me it's like yeah fuck you you know but i just funny. got to be like it was just like got to be a bummer you know and um he became kind of like a bull you know almost like a bully you know yeah that and, can happen sometimes yeah and then the more like i didn't say anything or stick up for myself sometimes they when bullies get you in that position and you start like closing in they almost like pick on you more yeah you know what i mean oh yeah and that's how it was i felt like i'm just like done with it but and it was a shame because it was really i mean i recommend if anybody could find the record it's friggin awesome you know mm-hmm. and i was really happy because i wrote a lot of stuff on the record and i was writing a lot of lyrics on it so i was pretty happy with like I got to do a lot of stuff that I didn't do before, you know, like, especially writing lyrics, you know, so I was, and I was really into it, you know, until, like I said, touring just became, it was brutal, you know, and when we toured over there too, he would, we'd go over for like a long time, you know, for someone like me, I love Japan, but like Zach was like, fuck, a month over here, I want, you know, some American food, that's what it was Zach, you know, yeah. he's like, this is, you know, I could go and eat like Japanese, like fast food, and like the, I could go to the 7 Eleven and eat like the onigiri and just like the weird Japanese. I could eat all that stuff because I've been there like probably, gosh, like 15 times. Oh, I'm jealous. But Zach was like, it might have been the first or second time he'd been there. So he was just like, you know, I miss my girlfriend. I'm, and that's dead of winter too. So it's like fucking snowing over there. Oh, yeah. And we're playing every day. And Takashi is funny because he um, <clears throat> he booked in the middle of winter because he was able to get the rock clubs cheaper. Uh-huh. You know, he would rent them and then sell tickets. And we did great, but he, he's like, if we tried to get these rock clubs in the summer or spring, they're twice as much money to, like, try to get them, you know, get those clubs, you know. Yeah, that's the season for it and everything. So yeah. you guys are four-walling venues, huh? Yeah, kind of, but we were making money, you know. I, I don't know exactly how he's doing it, but it was like the way he was doing it was like getting it. Sometimes maybe the venue would do it, but it was still cheaper because it was the winter time. Yeah. You know, but we were doing it sometimes with like hardly any days off, and it was brutal. It was like like really brutal, you know, and, <laughs> So, yeah, I just, you know, and then when Zach told me he's not going to do it, and Zach was weird because Zach goes, I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to use you as an excuse. He told me. What? (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. Like, he he (laughs) goes, I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to use you. And I'm like, what? So I'm like, well, I can't let him do that, so I'm going to have to quit, you know, before. So I remember flying home and then just writing an email going, I'm done with this because I don't, you know. Because then, if I'm done, Zach couldn't use me as an excuse. Yeah. You could get another guitar player or whatever. I'm out of here. I'm not doing it anymore. But I knew Zach wasn't doing it. And so it's like, there was no point. You know what I mean? Oh, that's rough, man. Yeah, I know when I was doing uh, that tribute band to Primus, uh-huh. I was really uh, trying to ride that edge of, 
you know, we really got to lock these songs down, but right. I don't want to make it uh, a pain in everyone's ass. Yeah, you know? I mean, it's, it's got to like, be fun. Yeah, it's got to be fun. And there, like I said, there's nothing wrong with rehearsing and getting it tight. But I mean, I just think it's got there's got to be a balance and it's got to be like, you know. Oh, another thing he did, too. So the guy who put the band together was a friend of mine, half Japanese guy. And um, his name's Shion. He's a little bit of like of a play. He like, he's a party guy. He likes to do drugs and he likes to, you know, mess around with, he likes to party with chicks. And so Takashi didn't like that. So Takashi fired him. And the guy's like one of my best friends. So like I'm over there the second tour and Shion is not allowed to come around. So the only time when I could hang out with Shion, who put the band together, by the way, right? The only time when I could hang out, out with him was like on my day off. And on my day off, I should be able to hang out or be friends with anybody I want. But Takashi told me, like, I can't be friends. You can't be friends with him. What? And, and guy's you know, a friggin' tyrant. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I'm an adult. You can't tell me who I... Yeah. I mean, I can understand if you say Shion can't come around your gig, right? If you're in the band and you don't want him to come to the show. But, like, it's my day off. You can't tell me who I can hang... Yeah, he was a total tyrant. But he said oh that, God. and I was, like, shocked. I mean, I was like... This is not happening. You can't tell me who I could be friends with or not, you know? Yeah. What the hell? Let me it, see. I think I found some of it on Spotify. Yeah, some of it was really good. I might get in trouble for playing it. I'll play a little bit. This is the single you guys did, Speed Racing Superstar. Yeah, and I is wrote it? the yeah, I wrote the lyrics, which is really cool. I'll put a link to that in the. Uh, oh, that's cool! It's on Spotify. That's cool. Yeah, it's on Spotify. It's got uh, it's got the full length uh, Alley Cats LV EP with six tracks on it. Wow! Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So I'll have to definitely link that below, man. I gotta ask push, Takashi. Push the Alley Cats. Where, where's my royalties, man? Right? Because yeah, if that's like my. Any. Yeah, I doubt it, but you know. But yeah, it's cool. Uh, I got to write a lot of the lyrics on there, which I was like really stoked and to be a part of that. And um, yeah, like I said, it was really great. And it was kind of a shame that it came to that, you know. But like, you know, I did fight, stick up for myself at one point. But then, I, like I said, towards the end of the tour, I was just kind of like waiting. You know, I'm in Japan, a foreign country. So I'm not going to cause too much trouble, you know, and I want to get paid. I wanted to finish all my gigs to get paid, you know, but I was just like the last few days. It was just, I was just kind of like counting down, like I want to get paid and get the fuck out of here. <laughs> it just was, it became miserable, you know? Yeah. And like I said, I, you know, I don't think Takashi's a bad guy. He just might've been, I think he was a little bit, um, just misguided, you know, almost like, not getting what you know, maybe trying too hard. You know what I mean? Almost. You know? Yeah, you know, sometimes they got that uh, that really intense like Japanese workout. Yeah, it's like, like it was it was just too much. You uh, know. Yeah, it's not. And for him, and he probably just goes, "These fucking lazy Americans." You know oh yeah, I mean? exactly. I mean, probably, but um, there's got to be some middle ground, you know. And I, like I said, the the thing that got me was. You know, I can almost deal with the intensity with the music, but when when he told me like who I can and can't be friends with, oh. that was just too much. I remember him having a talk with me, and it was funny because like uh, uh, after Faster Pussycat broke up in like the, I guess it was like ninety four ninety five, I went to school. I went back to school. I went to Pierce College and I studied Japanese, and then I went to UCLA and I studied like three years. Japanese and I had a Japanese girlfriend and I went to Japan. I lived there for a while so I could understand J J Japanese well enough. So when Takashi's telling me it, he's speaking to me in Japanese and telling me I can't be friends with this guy. So I'm just kind of listening and I'm going, am I hearing this right? Because Japanese is like 
I understand it really good, but it's still like 80%, 85%. So I'm just going, am I, am I misunderstanding something here? So I'm really listening to him and I just go, no, he's telling me I can't be friends with this guy. Like in Japanese too. <laughs> I'm like, this is just weird. I'm like, fuck that, you know? Jeez. And, um, and whether Takashi's right about Shion or not, you know, being a playboy or being a, you know, Bad, whatever, bad. I mean, I need to make that decision. I'm an adult. I need to make that decision, you know. And like and I said, Sh Shion, the guy who he told me not to be friends with, yeah. he actually put the band together, you know. It was <laughs> weird. He was like, you know. That's excessive. Yeah, it's and crazy. it's rock and roll. I yeah, mean, you're yeah. dealing with nefarious characters all the time. Yeah, That's like yeah, half yeah. the fun of it. Yeah. And I always look back, I regret, a l you know, I regret some of the stuff. You know, I was going through a tough time, too. Where I was like, to you know, I mean, the time I was kind of abusing a lot of like drugs, so I wasn't fully maybe at my best either. You know, I mean, I take a little responsibility, but I just can remember, just you know, just so stressed out. You know, that was yeah. probably causing me to take some of the drugs. You know. Well, I mean, you don't get into rock and roll for, uh, you know, it's not a it's not a vow of silence that you're taking as a right, monk or right, anything, right, you know. Right. You came here to party and mm. hang out with chicks and get yeah, into yeah. trouble and yeah. tour around the world, man. Yeah. Like, I mean, who? what else do you join a band for? That's yeah. like the, those are the perks that it comes with. Yeah, but it was just, it was like, you know, and yeah, Takashi, he, you know, but even like when Zach was like going, what's fucking up with Takashi? We'd get up in the morning and we'd be like, He'd get us up early, in the, and we'd get out of our hotel room, and we'd be in um, Tokyo. Instead of, like, getting a cab, we should have got, like, a cab or yeah, – but he'd have us walking in the street with our fucking suitcase to, like, the train station to get on a train to go to, like, the next venue or something. And I'd be like, I understand saving some money, but it's like we're all, like, close to fi you know 50 at the time. It's like – we should travel a little bit, like, and yeah, spend a little money and fucking get a fucking taxi or a limo or, yeah. I mean, once in a while, you know, but it was so funny because Zach had this, he overpacked, of course, <laughs> and he had this fucking suitcase that had a broken wheel. So for Zach, oh going fucking through the streets of Tokyo to the next, it was hard. And you got to go up these stairs and he's fucking things heavy. And he's got this huge suitcase with too much shit in it. So it's fucking heavy. So Zach was miserable. Yeah. And Takashi's like sitting there, you know, with this little, he did, did it all the time. So Takashi's got this little tiny fucking bag. Oh, he's know. prepared for it, he's of course. He's totally prepared. And, um. And he's walking in front of us, not waiting. And Zach's like struggling, you know. And I'm like, and Zach's like, "Fuck this! I'm not doing this again." <laughs> and you know, Takashi. And it's morning time, and Takashi's got like a frown on his face, like, like he just fucking ate a bug or something. Yeah. And um, I remember Zach go, "What the fuck is up with that fucking guy?" I, go, I don't fucking know. Fuck fucking cares he's in a bad mood but take it out you know it's like one of those guys that makes everybody know he's in a bad mood and it's like yeah. it's got to show it you know Wants and make everybody else, else around well it's got to make everybody else miserable you know it's like dude we're in japan let's let's have a good time and you had just because you know but it was like that so i mean i remember we were like on the train i was sitting next to zach and he's like yeah i'm not gonna he goes i'm not gonna do i go really there's no way i go you know He's like, no. I'm like, well, fuck. Then I was just planning my escape, you know. <laughs> yeah, if you can't bring your buddy along, man, I mean, yeah. you know, you're just well, getting tortured just for like, money. Like, who cares? So early, too. When you got a band that's so new, like only a year or two old, and the members are already changing, yeah, it's a bad sign, I think. Oh, know? yeah. It's a bad sign. Man. And, um, no matter, you know, I don't blame everything. Like I said, I don't blame everything on Takashi. I just think me and Zach, too, our headspace wasn't in that right headspace to maybe deal with him. And I was not in good shape. Like I said, I was abusing a lot of fucking shit at the time. So I was like, you know, I mean, I take some responsibility at the same time, you know. But it was great. I mean, what we did together as a band was f really freaking great. You know what I mean? And it's the thing, I like I said, it was so good. It's a shame that it didn't like last, you know? Yeah, I don't even think you guys played in America. I never heard we of it. We played Vamped one time. Did you really? Yeah, we played Vamped. Did I? Was I there? Or say I like 2017? Know. Was that like one of my nights off or something? <laughs> the few? I thought maybe. 
Maybe I was there and I was just really high. Maybe it could have been possible yeah. that could have been a thing. But we did play Vamped one night with with that band and um Yeah, but Oh man. But yeah, I was excited That's about funny. the band. I, can't remember too. I that. mean we did we did we made some really great music and um you know, we had big plans and stuff, but like I said, it just got to be like, when, when I found out Zach wasn't coming, it was funny too, because like we were in Japan around like November, in like maybe even late November into part of December, and then he was already making plans to come back like in January. And I mean, he was already kind of booking it, like booking venues and everything. And then uh, Zach said, I'm not coming back. And I'm just like, well, fuck. I, you know, I'm not coming back with a different singer. Fuck that. You yeah. Know? I'm just not doing it, you know. Oh, yeah, you guys played 2016. Oh, you know what? I think I was gone by then. Oh, you might have been. Huh? I might have. I must have been gone by then. Yeah, I forget the timeline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I went into all that corporate shit. That's what shit. I was thinking. I was thinking maybe you had left FAMP by when, when we played there. You, had, you had maybe you had left there. Yeah, I think that was that. I went in, I went into corporate around like 2015, something oh, like that. Okay. Started started wearing a suit and tie and cut all, all right. my hair off. Yeah, right, right on. It was worth it. Yeah, money was great, and I actually became a really good tech. Like, yeah, that's cool. They throw you on. They throw you into some pretty uh, pretty heavy, heavy situations. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they're just cool. it's, it's all like state of the art gear, and so yeah. it was fun. But yeah, I'm bummed I missed it, man. I really uh, I really love everything you do. It was fun. How's Zach Throne doing, anyways, man? I gotta yeah, have I him on. I haven't talked to him for a long time. I mean, I think he, we kind of. What was weird is, like I said, he was planning to quit that thing, so I quit before him. <laughs> but he was telling me it was really weird. He goes, he told me, he goes, I'm gonna blame you. I'm gonna quit. But I'm gonna use you as excuse. I'm like, Why would you tell me that? So I'm like, I have to quit before him, so he can't use me as excuse. So, but since I quit before him, he stayed over in Japan with his girlfriend. When, and I came back. Right? When we were done touring with Alley Cats, he had like a week off afterwards, and he stayed there to vacation with his girlfriend. Awesome. But he had to deal with Takashi, meaning like oh. I came home and quit right away, so I'm sure that shit blew up. He, Takashi was probably asking like me, for meetings, hold meetings, while Zach was over there trying to have a vacation with with his girlfriend. Oh, my God. He's probably saying, we got to meet tonight. <laughs> so I'm sure it wasn't fun because Zach was planning to quit. So Zach probably had to lie at the meeting and go, well, maybe we could get this. You know, when Zach all along was new, you know. Yeah. So I think Zach was kind of, I don't know. He might have been mad at me a little bit. He came back to um, America and we had a talk. We didn't talk. I thought it'd be fine. And then um, I was doing, do you remember that guy, that, the big guy who died who was doing, had the radio show hmm. in town? Nah. There was a guy who had like a radio, and me and Zach, well, I had a radio show on there. Oh, yeah. I came on with Cracker yeah, Man yeah, and yeah, Tyler. We made, on, a, yeah. we made a fools of ourselves, Yeah, man. do you remember the guy who was running it? I don't remember him, But though. he was a real big guy. He di he passed away. What was the radio show called again? God, I Mine was like Mondays with a Musk hat. But um, what's weird is like Zach got on the radio, got his own radio show because of me. Okay. And I remember coming home and I, I think we were home. And then I think I asked Zach, like I called in one, one more, like one time to his radio show. And if it was anybody else, if it was like Todd Kearns and I called in, Todd Kearns would have put me on the radio if it's Brent Muscat calling in. Yeah. But I called in, and um, they put me on hold, but I could hear them talking. They didn't, like, mute their mics. And um, I had asked the guy who was running the radio show, I'm like, hey, play my single, the single I have just released. Yeah. Hey, have Zach play it or put me on the radio. I'll talk, have some fun. And then Zach wouldn't put me on. What a jerk. And he was, yeah, he was a jerk and he was talking shit. I heard the mics were open. Yeah. So like the guy goes, so you want to bring it on? He goes, no, fuck that guy. He's like, fuck him. I mean, <laughs> he wants you to play a single. Oh, he's so desperate. I heard Zach like, talking shit about me and I was like, so mad. I'm like, I was so hurt that like since then, I think my, I had a friend who was my assistant at the time this uh, black girl named Lisa Jackson. And I was so hurt. I remember she ran over while he was on the radio and yelled at him for like talking shit. And um, 
I always thought, you know, Zach, it could have he could have been having a bad day or he could have been mad at me. But I always felt like he should have called me after that because, yeah. like, I heard everything he said. And he never called me and apologized. I mean, I never. And then after that, I was kind of mad at him. Not so much mad, but kind of hurt. Yeah. And then I just felt like I had, you know, after that, I've seen him since. And, like, we were fine. We actually jammed, I think, one time. Like, I think with Todd Kearns, I think he had me. We had, it was like a, like, Sin City Center's reunion. Oh, that's awesome. And I think we had Zach come up. And I think Zach played. And I didn't say anything. But, I mean, ever since then, I always felt like Zach kind of owed me a bit of an apology, you know, for that radio thing. If yeah. he thought I owed him an apology for Japan or something, I wish he would have said something. Or if he was mad, you know what I mean? Yeah. But there just wasn't that communication. It was more like him talking shit. Oh, that's harsh, man. And I just felt like a lot of it was like him being like, me and Zach had a funny, Zach is so talented. Oh, yeah. But I think he was always had this je- a little bit of a jealousy thing about me because it was like, Zach never got like a big record deal. Even though as, as talented as, as he is, he never had like some of the stuff I had. Like a, I had like a, you know, number one MTV. I've yeah. got a gold record. Yeah, you got that gold record with uh, Faster Pussycat. Yeah, yeah. Right? And with Faster Pussycat, I, you know, gold record, number one, you know, videos. I got to do that. And um, so Zach, I always felt like there was a little bit of a jealousy thing with him. Um. Yeah, because he, he's such a phenomenal talent. He's so great, but I think he would look at someone like me, because I never gave a fuck about, like, I've always came from the Keith Richards school of, like, playing one note. Yeah. You know? I never gave a fuck about being, like, ripping or being, like, you know, I was in a glam band. We put on, like, <laughs> we, we put on lipstick and, and spray, you know, sprayed our hair out to here. Yeah. Zach was, came from a different area. He came from, like, New York, where it was, like, into, like, anthrax and heavy bands you know oh yeah so i think there was always a thing with me and zach where he would look at me and go well fuck why is brent getting this shit <laughs> you know why is brent getting this attention or brent getting this you know i'm a, i always felt like zach was would have some kind of this jealousy thing like or a competition thing you know yeah you know i always felt like that and um zach's great i mean fuck as far as singers go he's run laps around me singing wise guitar wise he's can shred he could do shit i can't even imagine doing oh yeah but um and bass and everything oh he's so talented but sometimes with all that talent you know you need there's other things uh, sometimes it's like the guys that are less talented that get more famous you know that's just the way life is you know what i mean it's like the right place and right time you know what i mean yeah, it's uh, it's just it's I always uh, I always bring that up, you know. It's it you can be the best band in the world, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, it you doesn't know? matter. Nobody it really, cares about the songs you're writing or how yeah, talented yeah, you yeah. are. Yeah, like sometimes it doesn't matter. Thing it's a and, network. It's so many yeah. other. There's elements, you know what I mean? To yeah. it. Yeah, and sometimes it's just like right place, right time. Right place. I mean, but, I was really in the. I mean, with Faster Pussycat, I got signed right out of high school, but I mean, I was in the right. I was on Sunset Strip, right when like. Our band was playing with Guns N' Roses, right? When Guns N' Roses was just getting signed. You know, we were there. We were primed. You know, we were playing with Poison and Guns N' Roses before they were signed. Oh, that's so awesome. You know what I mean? We were there with them opening up. We were, I remember opening up for Guns N' Roses and Poison before both bands were signed. So we were in the right place at the right time. You know what I mean? Oh, dude, here's a good one I found of, uh, the hair. Oh yeah, yeah. I was looking for some good hair pictures. Yeah, yeah. See with the hair back. I got my, the the scarf and my earring. Oh man. And my you blue. were so young, dude. Yeah, dude. I was like eighteen. I was right out of high school, like eighteen or nineteen. You're beautiful there, man. You yeah. look like a chick, bro. Yeah. Totally pulling off the uh, the vibe of the eighties. Yeah. That was everyone's goal. How how close can I come but to looking see, like a oh, chick? Oh, and right there we had Kelly Nichols who got in a, on the very left, top left. Right here. Yeah, he got into LA Guns. He was a bass player, for he was in our band first, and then he got in a motorcycle accident. So we had to like he was in the hospital. So we had to play, kind of go on without him and, and start playing with a, another bass player. But when he got better, he got into LA Guns and they got signed. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I got, um, I actually have uh, Scotty he, Griffin coming on. Oh, cool. For, uh, he was in LA Guns. Yeah, he's still in. I guess he's in like R- Steve Riley's LA Guns now. Oh, is that what it's, yeah, he's still think, doing it, yeah, huh? I think he's still doing it. I think there's like 
two LA guns. I think there's like Tracy and Phil's like L the LA guns. And then you have Steve Riley's LA guns. I think Scotty Griffin's still doing that, I think. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And I actually like their, it's funny, I like some of them. Um, I heard like Scotty's stuff with LA guns. And it's pretty good stuff. I actually like it. I'm I'm kind of a supporter, you know. Oh yeah, man. He's a he's a great great musician and uh, just a lot of fun. Yeah. Freaking Scotty, man. So yeah, how was it? How was it touring around with Faster Pussycat? Those guys are uh, crazy. It was great. I mean, you know, I got to. I mean, I was there at the. I was there when we were on a major label. So I was there when it was like. When we had like r big tours, you know, I yeah. was there for the the prime. The, and then the band broke up for like seven years or so, and we got back together. I think we broke up in '94, and let's see, '95, '96, '97, '98, '99, 2000, 2000. Yeah, we got back together about seven years, like a reunion. And I did it for a little bit, but then it just got to be like the same. It wasn't like. You know, when you're doing it later in life and you're doing it without the big record company, any, you know, you're doing it by yourself. Yeah. It's not the same as it was. I mean, when we were doing it back in the day, we'd had tour, tour. We were opening up. We were out on tour with Motley Crue on Dr. Feelgood tour, you know. So oh, that's awesome, man. And we, you had a, we had a manager and we had a tour manager and we had an attorney and we had an agent and we had a, I mean, we had everything. It was like... You know, back when we were big, you know, and you had the record company putting money into it, too. They'd put, like, tour support into it. So it's just, it was like, it was a, just a different, it was a totally different time, you know. There wasn't any, I mean, I were, when I was touring, there was no internet. Nobody was doing the internet or any of that, you know. Yeah, it's flyers. Yeah, I mean, it was actually, too, there wasn't even, when I first started touring, when you wanted to make a call, you'd have to go find a payphone. Oh You'd yeah! Get like a calling card, punch in a calling card number. It wasn't like we didn't have cell phones yet, you know. I caught the I caught the back end of that. I'm a child of the '80s, so yeah, I, yeah, I still yeah. remember having to go for a payphone, or the only phone you had yeah. was the phone at your house. And well, even in one of the Fast Pussycat songs, I laugh every time I hear the lyrics. It's like, in, in the, we have a song called "Bathroom Wall." Oh yeah, that's a, and there's super a lot, popular song. Yeah, there's a line in it, you know, about put another dime in the telephone. It's like <laughs> nobody would. Nowadays, nobody would understand what putting yeah. a dime, you know, and even, you know, a dime, it just shows you how old we are because it was quickly soon a quarter, you know, putting quarters in there, you know, but, um, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a good time. I mean, it was like, I got to travel the world and open for like, we opened for Kiss, Motley Crue, David Lee Raw. I mean, a lot of big bands and, um, you know, be, be a rock star when I was like 20, you know? Yeah, and a literal so, rock star, man. Yeah, it was cool. You know, and then like, I can remember there was like key moments that were like big memories for me. Like one of the big memories was like driving around LA and when we put the record out, you know, the song first hearing it on the radio, like on like KNAC or whatever the big radio station was in LA. The first time you hear your music, you know what I mean? Like on there, or you pull up and there's some, you know, you're driving down the Sunset Strip and there's some rocker chicks pulled on next to you and they got their stereo cranking and it's your music, like Faster Pussycat music. Yeah. There's no feeling, I mean, that was like a big deal, you know. That's I mean, a huge deal. Other things like getting the gold record was a huge deal. You know, the videos on MTV or going on MTV, when we were in New York, we'd go on MTV, Headbangers Ball with Ricky Rackman. Oh, I used to watch that all the time. Um, those were big deals, and seeing them later, those were all big deals. Um, but yeah, the, the, some of the memories, like when we pull into a town and girls would drive in with like a convertible, and they're just cranking your music, you know, and it's just so cool, you know, some hot chicks pulling up in a convertible, and they're just cranking it. Just like moments like that were like priceless, you know. Um, Playing my hometown and in, in, you know I'm from Los Angeles, so playing the for, um, LA Forum two nights, opening for Motley, that was like a big deal for me because like playing the Forum was like, and opening for Motley was like okay we've made it you know for me, it was like that moment where I go okay I've made it, you know what I mean like oh yeah I could die tomorrow and I could say I've kind of made it you know, 
you know, um, being able to give my father like a gold record when he was kind of the one like he wasn't, you know, he would never say don't do it, but he was always kind of like, maybe you should get a job or maybe, you know what I mean? Or this whole rock and roll before I had yeah. made, got signed. He was like, hey, you know, the, you know, your chances are making, you know, that kind of thing he wasn't super supportive. So w when I finally was able to give him a gold record, that was another moment. And then he hung it you know, on his wall at his work in his office, you know what I mean? That was an, awesome. another big moment, you know what I mean, where you're like, it's, it's like a trophy, you know? Like it's when a, you're, the best trophy you can yeah, get. Yeah, when you're like a kid, it's like getting like, you know, getting like a baseball trophy or something. Yeah. And then having your dad put, you know. So for me, that was a big deal because as growing up, my two, I had two older brothers, and they were always into sports, and they were really athletic. I was always more the artist, you know, I would always be the one painting or playing music, you know, I was not real super great at catching a, a baseball. Yeah. So for me, getting that gold record was like my, finally my trophy, you know what I mean? That's awesome. What did your, uh, what did your dad want you to do growing up? My dad always like tried to talk me into becoming an electrician. He was oh, in the really? construction industry. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It's what he knew, you know. So yeah, he yeah, was yeah. like trying to push me in that direction. He's like, "They make the best money. You got to be an electrician. I can help you out." Uh, I was like, "I'm not doing that, man." He never really said, it. you know. He always just the main thing for him is he he wanted me to get good grades, and then once I um graduated, he kind of wanted me to get a job right away. Um, when I graduated high school and um, he didn't like push me to go to college or push me any career. It was more like, you know, and I don't think he might, my, my, he didn't mind me being in a band, but he definitely wanted me to get a job. And it was like, if you're going to stay under my house, you're not going to just live here without going out now that you've graduated. So it was like, fuck, I can't get a job. The thing it was for me is I couldn't get a job in my, I lived like, on the suburbs of LA, out in a town called Monrovia, about 45 minute car drive from Hollywood. So there was no way I'd be able to get a job and then try to get out to rehearsal or yeah. or play at night. It was just too far, maybe it was an hour away. And if there was traffic, it could have been an hour and a half. But so I was like, I gotta move, I had, to, I had to move out right away and move to Hollywood, you know? And I'm glad I did, but I was just doing the, couch tour you know on everybody's yeah i lived on ricky rackman and my singers <laughs> they were roommates i lived on their couch for a while and i would get a girlfriend and live on her you know live with her you know just wherever i could i remember for a while it was like i was just like a i lived like five or six seven different places in hollywood just going back and forth but just to be out there because it was the place to be and we, we had gigs you know we were getting gigs and we were flyering on the strip, you know, and um, it was like our shows were getting packed. And I knew it was like Poison got signed, Guns N' Roses got signed, and like our manager, we had this woman manager who managed uh, Guns N' Roses and helped get them signed. So she had connections already now to the record company. So she was inviting record companies to our show. So we kind of knew like it's gonna happen. Yeah. You know? Man, it was hot. Like LA was heating up. Like labels started looking like, you know, Poison's taken, Guns N' Roses taken. They started kind of like it's like a, like we better get a band soon. Yeah. Because all the bands are starting to get you know the bigger bigger ones were getting swiped up. So we were like next in line. So it was like it was cool. I remember different labels coming to our shows. And it was like they'd come backstage. We'd talk. You know, schmooze with them. Hey, thanks for coming. You know and. And it was just fun. It was a funny time, you know. That's awesome. Totally different time. I remember we were trying to get, uh, we were trying to get the Cracker Man band signed. Yeah, and we yeah. were meeting with labels. Yeah, and they were just. They were interested in uh, a pre, like a finished product. They oh, were, yeah. they were, they're not gonna help push you or get you out or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, that they're was like, different time then. Yeah. I mean, when we did it, the A and R people they considered them artist development. Yeah, so they'd find you. And if they liked what you're doing in the clubs, they'd kind of work with you. They'd say they'd get your producer and go, you know, write more songs if they didn't think you had enough. But they were kind of interested in like developing you as an artist. You yeah. Know? Now they're like, how many people do you have on Instagram? How many yeah, followers? Yeah. Yeah. Now they want they don't you give to a do, shit they, about the they album. They pretty much want you to almost do it yourself. You yeah. Know? And then what's the point of having them? Yeah. Man? But back then it was cool because it was like the one good thing about our deal was that. Um, they kind of let us 
just go in and do on our first record all those songs were the songs we were playing in the clubs they didn't make us they didn't say write hit songs they just go we like what you're doing and we're not going to give you that much money so because they didn't give us that much money we had to make the record quick so we made like a punk rock record because it wasn't like Guns N' Roses got like 150,000 to make their first record and they spent like three months we got like 50 grand maybe a third of what they got and we probably did our record in like a week or two nice I mean and we just did everything we were playing in the clubs we p just put it on the record yeah the good thing about it is that that scene at the time like 86 Sunset Strip I always tell people one good thing about our record is if you want to hear how the strip sounded, our re our first record's good because all those songs were what we were playing in the clubs. You know what I mean? And they're just raw. They're just there. Not a lot of overdubs. Just like not brand new amps. I took my old Marshall. It was like tubes are halfway blown, and I just recorded with it. <laughs> you know, it sounds weird, but it's cool because it's like that's how kind we of kind of. That's kind of how we sounded in the clubs, you know? That kind of grungy, yeah, almost real punk raw. Yeah, sound, it was real right? punk, yeah. That's awesome. To this day, yeah. too. Uh, that was just the self titled album, right? Yeah, just Faster, Faster Pussycat. Pussycat. Yeah. What and, studio did you record that in? Um, gosh, something out in the valley in North Hollywood. Um, I forget the name of the place now. It was just like a place that wasn't anything super famous, kind of a smaller one out in, the, out in North Hollywood. Um, but like I said, we got such a small deal that they just stuck us in there and we just kind of just to go, you know, did drums, bass and my guitar, maybe a, a, one more, two tracks maybe. And it was just kind of done, you Run know, and gun. yeah, it was just kind of done. Um, yeah, it was, it was funny, you know, and what was cool about it is that the record when we got our deal was such a kind of a smaller deal compared to a lot of the bands at the time but we were happy because we wanted to be on Electra records and it was with Electra so but with Electra they had really big bands like they had Motley Crue and they had Metallica at the time so for Electra they kind of just gave us money and they didn't really care they didn't care about like come there wasn't anybody in the studio listening to us like going oh you got to write a hit there wasn't the pressure to write a hit song just like just put the record out and just see what happens and we were lucky we got a new manager whose name he was in a band himself called the grassroots like a 60s 70s band but he managed like quiet riot and he managed faith no more and he managed all these like ba bunch of bands so he knew he had the connections to get us out on tour and he got us out on tour and he just made us work he, he goes he put us out on tour and if we weren't playing we like our first tour i think was opening with for alice cooper and alice cooper's audience at the time was pretty hardcore it wasn't he wasn't didn't cross over to the pop stuff it was still like so they didn't want to hear us they just throw yeah. stuff at us oh, God. But, but he made us go, like, if we weren't playing, he, we'd go to a radio station, do radio interview. And then the next day, we'd go to, um, like, a record store, and we'd do an autograph signing for, like, people. He just made it. We didn't have a day off for, like, a year. And we just toured. And um, he went to New York, and he would schmooze, like, the record lane. goes, we need money for a video. We, he was able to get these things. We got a video, and, and he was able to go to MTV and talk to the people on MTV and, like, he really helped the manager really just made us work and um we were out for like we worked every day and it was like it was a to go gold it was like we actually didn't go gold on the first record we went gold on the second record i think but the first yeah. record we got close but it was like we worked for every single record we he just put us out and made us work like a year straight you know that's how you got to do it you and I was glad though, to, be out to have him. And he was just like, you guys are, you know, you got to, you think it's a day off. You know, you're going to, or we'd play a club. If we were, had another day off, we'd go play a club on our own. Like we'd go oh, headline really? a club. So we just worked like, and it was funny because it was like, finally, like towards the end of the record, I think we got, we opened for David Lee Roth and finally we got on MTV and finally you could see the crowd like now we're in magazines and stuff and now the crowd is starting to cheer instead of throwing it. you ah. know it's, at one point it started changing you know what i mean 
and bands like Poison and Guns N' Roses helped because it was a kind of a new scene that came out, new music, new style. So people go, okay, they're part of that Poison, Guns N' Roses thing, you know. So we came, it became kind of acceptable, you know, where the first, like, God, first 300, first nine or ten months was just like, just work, work, and brutal. <laughs> like, people, th- and we were just, and it toughened us up, though. We just, like, fuck yeah. you. We'd fight with people. <laughs> and we'd get in punchy fight. It was funny, because here I am looking like that, but I'm jumping in the crowd and punching people. <laughs> we're getting beat That's up awesome. and punching people. And, but a tough, quickly, we came, we became, like, a tighter, tougher band. Like, if you saw us, like, that picture, and if you saw us, like, nine or ten months later, we got, <laughs> we looked a little tougher. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. It, uh, yeah, I see here's another, here's a good one of you guys a little bit later. Probably, yeah. Let me see here's a minute. Where you started wearing the hat. Yeah, and you, you can see, like, the... you see how all of our hair is not up, like, anymore. Yeah, you're not doing the super glam thing. Yeah, we kind of slowly, you know, that was one thing where, like, bands, like, other bands, and we kind of started doing more of a gypsy kind of look, you know, and got a little less glam. But even after that, we got even a little more tougher. We're like, you know, our hair's flatter, you know what I mean? <laughs> not as much like you could see. I still look pretty, but I'm not wearing, like, lipstick there. Right, I can find another one too, where you're a little more punk rock in it. But yeah, we we definitely, and then we had we we play with we opened up for Motorhead. Oh, so like, Motorhead's so loud. Oh yeah, but bands like that toughened us up. You know, we had to get a little tougher and like fight back. And um, one thing we never got booed off stage, even if we got booed, we stayed on stage. You know what I mean, we we never gave up. You know. Yeah, you guys were. You guys are badass. They just started doing uh, even a little more of like an industrial sound later yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, we did. We got, you know, bands like Nine Inch Nails came out and we started doing. And then the, I think on our second oh, album. One too. Yeah. So, yeah, you could see we're a little, it's not as like glam. You know, if you look yeah. at the first one, it's, a, you know. Leather jackets and. Yeah, a little tough up a little hair. bit. Yeah. Long hair, you know. A little more grungy, yeah. You know. And then grunge came out. Nirvana came out, I think, on our third record. And we love that stuff, you know. All the stuff from Seattle, like Nirvana and Soundgarden and stuff. So we we were definitely kind of, even some of our music on our third record, we had some kind of songs that were a little heavier and more, you know, grungy and stuff. We loved that stuff. That stuff ended up killing us, like killing the L.A. scene. yeah. But we loved it. I didn't. I never knew. Like I loved Nirvana, so it was like people go, "Do you? Don't you hate Nirvana?" They kind of, I go, "I think they're great." You know, it's just that people got tired of like the kind of hair metal they called it, and they just wanted more grungy stuff. You know. Yeah, I think that was the beginning of when like the record labels really latched on to this uh, cookie cutter um, scenario where they go, "Oh, so this sounds doing really well." Let's oh, get that, a dozen other bands that sound just that's like what this. Happened. Well, that's what happened with L- in L.A. When we got signed, it was like that because Poison got signed, Guns Rose got signed, then we got signed. And then after us three, you know, and it was like those three bands made it pretty big. But after that, a billion bands in our little genre and time in L.A. got signed. Yeah. They just started signing everything saying, let's see what happens. Let's throw it out there. And a lot of the bands didn't make it. Some bands did. But then Nirvana happened up in Seattle, and then all the record companies did the same thing. Yeah. Nirvana got signed, Pearl Jam. And so all the like companies go, we got to get our we got to get our Seattle. Any band, if you were in Seattle, you were getting signed, you know? Yeah. I, I told my friend, I had friends that were in L.A. trying to get signed. I'm like, you guys should have just moved to Seattle. <laughs> if you guys go to Seattle and throw on some grunge clothes, you guys will be signed. Because labels were signing everything up there, you know? But only the top, you know, five bands probably made it. You know, you had Alice in Chains and Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Nirvana. You know, you had five, five or six, you know? Yeah, that was I was uh that was definitely like my era right there mm. when I was growing up, man. That, I loved it. That, that you, grunge you know, stuff. It was great. I loved it. 
but I still I ended up going backwards and and really enjoying all the uh, the hair metal. And oh the, yeah, yeah. Eighties rock. That was my high school jams, man. Everyone yeah. was listening to hip hop, and we were listening to Motley Crue and Faster yeah, Pussycat. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then like Guns N' Roses, was, I mean, still are a great band, but oh, yeah. that first record they did that is such a great record. Still to this right. day is probably one of my. Fa- I mean, I would put it up there with one of my favorite, and that's for me. And be, because there was sort of competition. Um, I don't like a lot of the bands that were in LA, they were competition. I didn't like them that much, you know, <laughs> like, oh, they're, you know, like, but Guns N' Roses, that album was so good. And Slash was such a great guitar player that was like, whoa, you know. And he was like the first that became, he was more bluesy and like tasty. Not so yeah. like, it wasn't all about just how fast he is, you know what I mean? How much he could shred. It was more like his licks are just friggin' tasty, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, they really brought a musical influence into yeah, it instead yeah. of just the attitude. It yeah, was very yeah. musically inclined. Yeah, um, they were great. Yeah, yeah. Where, where like, I mean, I like I like Poison. We toured with them. We were friends with them. But it was like I went I wouldn't go buy a Poison record, so to speak. But you know, even Motley, I'm not a huge fan. Even though we toured with them, I love Motley. Yeah. And I got because of Motley, I, I mean, that, they're a big reason I have a gold record. You know, but as far as like. You know, I would always get disappointed with Motley, especially when they did the bullshit of like, this is our last tour, so come buy tickets. <laughs> Find our, th-, you know, and then they tore up. It's like, I knew it was bull. Uh, I told all my friends, I go, such bullshit. They're, this isn't their last tour. You yeah. Know? It's just like a way for them to like sell tickets. You know? Yeah. It's like you Kiss know? or Ozzy, yeah, man. Yeah, doing you know, the bullshit. You constantly know? doing the farewell tours. Yeah. You know, I don't know if they, they do it as a gimmick or if they really, you know, they think they're going to not want to play music anymore. Because, like, what are you going to do with I your think, life? I know, exactly. Especially when the bills come, you know, they run out of money. It's like, yeah, oh, we better tour again. Um, I think maybe at one point they might really think it's their last tour. But I also think when they see the hype, they're just like, let's just go with it. We're selling a lot of tickets. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. And I think in the back of their mind, they know, like, oh, we can always, if we want to, we could tour again. Even if they're not, they might think, this is our last tour. But you know what? We can still do it if we want to, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. I know Kiss is no- no- notorious for doing that, man. Oh, and yeah. Unfortunately, Ozzy, though, now, I mean, who knows? Every every year, we're lucky to even get anything out of that we, guy. Uh, Fast and Pussycat, we opened for Ozzy, I think, around 92? Or 93. And I remember then he said it was his last tour. Oh, God. The tour we did was supposed to be his last tour. 30 years ago. Yeah. And it was called the, because his record at the time was called, I think, No More. No More Tears. No More so Tears. No right? More Tours. That right? was it. Yeah. We did that tour, the No More Tours tour. And I just laughed it. And so now when I see bands saying, you know, I go, yeah, we played Ozzy's last tour last tour 30 years ago no more, you know so i never believe it i always think it's like i think a lot of it's a gimmick you know yeah it gets you to buy tickets man, yeah and a sure. lot of people fall for it i'm just like oh boy you know i call and the motley crew one was easy to call you know and i always said i mean they're gonna tour even though i knew i knew mick morris was kind of ill not in great health but i'm like they're going to tour, even if they have to, you know, replace him. You know, they're going to tour, yeah. you know, again, you know. But, yeah, I mean, I guess if you're a fan of Mick Mars, I would say, yeah, maybe go see the tour because, you know. But he's still alive. You know, I wish him well. You know what I mean? Yeah, he was old when they started. Yeah, he was old when they started. And he has oh. some kind of thing. I mean, last time they played, he's just in one spot and barely moves, you know. Yeah, he's getting up there, man. Yeah. I wonder how old that dude is now. He was old, though, like you said, when they started. Yeah, and Vince Neil, I mean, I, you see pictures of that guy now, and yeah. he's super out of shape, man. Yeah, he's, he's funny he's, guy. Yeah, he's crazy, man. It's a but wild I dude. Mean, like I said, I with Motley, I have it's almost like a love-hate relationship. It's almost when you know people too well. Yeah. Because we toured with them a lot, and um, I just... There's things I love about Motley, and there's things I t- just don't like. I didn't like the 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 last tour thing. I didn't like also too. I felt like when Motley did that one, I saw that tour, and it was they were so bad that I thought thought like, would it really hurt for you guys to fucking go rehearse? <laughs> you know, yeah, no shit. It was like, and so much shit was on tape. Like I was hearing, 
Nikki, there was a mic hanging down. Nikki was nowhere near a mic. Yeah. Tommy's upside down, not able to sing. Vince Neil's going like this, and Mick Mars is up there, not, and there's no mic by him, but let, yet you hear those fucking backup vocals coming out. Yeah, perfect background vocals. Yeah, and it sounds like one's from, it doesn't even sound live, it sounds like right off the record, like just sample, and I'm like, if I want, why am I fucking, I want to yeah. see a live band. You're just paying I to go see them the dance to the record. I saw them at the joint, and I'm like, these fucking guy just fucking rehearse, man. Would it really hurt? I uh, really felt like, oh God, this Fuck, man. <laughs> Even if they wanted it, I'd rather them get the fucking backup singers up there. Yeah. Or have some people on stage like like Axel did and have 10 guys up there. I mean, at least you're not playing with a bunch of to tapes because that's like, at some point it's like, what the fucking, this is like karaoke. Oh, you know yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, it's terrible. And it makes everybody else, like, it's like steroids in sports, man. It's yeah. just like, it's not fair to the people that go up there and really do it. Well, and you know what, what? So I saw that. And then the main thing that, then I saw, not too long later, maybe half a year later, I saw Def Leppard play the same room, and Def Leppard sounded great. Yeah. And the guys are up there. You could see them. They're singing in the mic, and you could hear, me being a musician, I could hear that stuff's live. You know, I know it's not on tape. Yeah. I could hear the shit's on tape. It's, you know, but I'm going, fuck, they rehearsed. You could see they rehearsed. And they're all trying, and they're all fucking playing, and they're singing in harmony, and sounds good. And you go, that's what a band should do. You could tell Def Leppard went and rehearsed, but also there's like a love, they must have a love for the music, you know? Oh, yeah. And they're real musicians, man. Real musicians, and a respect for it. So when I saw that, I was like, fuck, man. Like, I'm like, Motley and my <laughs> lost a lot of points, you know what I mean? Where I would be like the first one. And I'm always telling people, you know what? I'll be the first one to wish Motley well. Like, next tour, I hope they go and rehearse. You know? I wish, <laughs> I want them to sound good. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm rooting for them. Even Vince Neil, like, I want him to get in shape, and I want him to sing great. I'd be, you know, because they're my child. In some ways, they were my child. I would painted a picture. When I was in high school, I painted a picture of Nick, Nicky Six, you know? Oh, awesome. A big old, like, portrait of him you know really so and, and like i said because of nikki we you know because of that band and a lot of be, because of nikki um our bass player eric who was in one of the pictures up there he lived with nikki for a while but um you know he had a big decision when they had like five bands up to tour with them he went okay we'll take faster pussycat you know and without them like I said, I would not probably even have a house. Maybe I wouldn't even have a house here, you know. So I owe them a lot. But at the same time, I won't, when I go see them live, it's like, yeah. fucking rehearse. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Dude, it's so Mick I Mars feel is... like I get pissed when, like, I see bands take yeah. advantage of fans. Yeah. You know, I get kind of mad. You know, to me, I just think, oh, come on, you know. It's too, it's too easy. It's not like you guys are have to go to school to become a doctor or a lawyer or a rocket scientist. It's fucking rock and roll. Yeah. All you got to do, your job is just fucking rehearse a little bit at least. Do you know what I mean? Maybe <laughs> not, as much show. As, not as much as Takashi wanted, but fuck, five hours maybe, you know, something. Yeah. No, it says uh, Mick Mars is, uh, he turned 70 in May. Wow. Yeah, he's older than my freaking dad. Yeah, and he has, like I said, he has some kind of disease where his bo something with his bones or something. I think, yeah, I think right. It has to do with the bones. Uh, and so he yeah. can't move real well, you know. Ank ankylos ankylosing spondylitis. Yeah. That is a that's a freaking word right there. Let me pull it up here on the thing so people can read it. It's right here. Uh, struggled with <laughs> it's chronic inflammatory form of arthritis. Yeah, and that's why you see him. He doesn't move a lot, you know. So. And like I said, I wish him well. You know, I, man, you know, I pray for a cure for that, or they find medicine to help him. Yeah. And I hope he lives to 120. You know, and like I said, Vince Neil. I shared one thing one time, and people got mad at me because I shared something of like Vince Neil. But I'm like, it's not a big deal. You know, he fuck, he could get in shape. I'm wishing him well. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just like poking a little fun. You know what I mean? Of course, it's but all it's in good like, fun, man. You know. 
fuck, you know, I gained weight over this last year sitting on my ass at home, you know, but I'll lose it, you know. It's like, it's rock and roll, just, you know. But when I go out and play, I try to, like, you know, try to, like, enjoy it and do it for the fans and not cheat people, you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, you you're know. still playing a live show yeah. down here every weekend. I'm really, yeah, I'm pretty lucky. I've been able to, since I moved up here in 2004, I've been able to pretty much kind of make I mean, some years have been better than others, but pretty much like a living at doing playing music. So I'm pretty lucky, you know. Yeah, you were I doing think. the Saints or the uh, Sinners forever. Sinners, yeah, and at one point, the Sinners, when we had Todd Kearns and we had the original guys, at our height, we were playing like Green Valley Ranch when they had the ovation room in there. Oh, that's a great room, man. Was, yeah, now it's like a bingo parlor, which is, oh. bums me out. Is it really? Yeah, it was one of, to me, that was my favorite room. And like out of every room I've ever played in all Vegas, that was the best room. And I was yeah. like, why would you take the best room in Vegas and turn it into a bingo parlor? You know? Dude, they had the, what was it, Midas XL8s in there. They Those are still one of the first oh. really major digital desks. They're like a quarter million dollars a piece. Yeah, and we'd come in and the guy would hit one button and it'd pull up all of our like scene. Yeah. You know, like all of our settings were there, you know? Hit, the the monitor guy would just hit one button and psh, all the things would be there. Yeah, and put, I'd put in my little whatever like, in ears in ears, and it would sound it sounded great. And we would do great there, and we would like. It was funny because Yellow Brick Road would play there Friday. We played Saturday. <sighs> what a great band that was! Yeah, Yellow yeah, Brick yeah. Road, man, they're they were great, amazing. Yeah. But we played Saturday, and they were, it was funny because they're like you know they draw more than you because they've been around longer. But he goes, you guys outsell them on the bar because <laughs> we would, ah. we were outselling their bar. We were out sell, doing like b bigger bar tab than them because people were like they were real serious, so they wouldn't really drink too much on stage. Us on the other hand, we'd have fucking shots lined up the front of the stage. We'd have shots lined up all the way across, and Do Doc Ellis, Michael Ellis would just get drunk he'd get on people's like shoulders in the audience and he'd start going out into the casino and the security had to stop him he'd be like so just ripping drunk that's know? awesome but we'd have like drinking games and like every time like you you know i say brent muscat you got to take a drink todd would say something <laughs> and, brent muscat, and people drink you know but yeah it was funny because they would go yeah yellow brick road has a little bit bigger cr we had a, a nice crowd it was pretty full but yellow brick road would like just everything was sold out, but full, just completely full. Where ours was maybe ninety percent, but I remember them saying, "Yeah, but you guys do better, you know." Bar. But we would do that. We'd encourage people like, "Who's drinking?" We really like, we're pushing like the drinks, you know. Yeah, because you guys started over at a dive bar, right? Yeah, the first dive bar, the old dive bar, the old one. Yeah, yeah. and it was cool because we did Tuesday nights, so it was like a night, kind of like all the shows and stuff were off. And so Tuesday, there's nothing going on. So everybody would, a lot of casino people would come there. That's what I was doing. I was yeah. working at uh, House of Blues in Mandalay Bay uh, yeah. for the most part. And yeah, it was like a night off. And yeah. most of the House of Blues crew would come and see you guys play because you were fantastic. Yeah, 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 yeah. It show. was fun. It was really raw. That was really good. But that led to a lot of good stuff for us. You know what I mean? Just because with that little dive bar thing and doing Tuesday, a lot of like, we used to have guys from Blue Man come in and jam with us and like people from different shows and showgirls would come in and like all the bands in town, nothing was going on. So they'd come in and we'd have people jam with us, you know. I remember Chris Kill, he was a bartender for a while there. He was his name was Chris Sprinkle, right? <laughs> I think his real name's Chris Sprinkle. <laughs> But um, yeah. he'd get up and jam with us before he ever was like in Five Finger Death Punch. Yeah, you know? and, um, and it was funny because like now I see him. He's Chris Kell, but I'm like, yeah, Chris used to get up and. I mean, all these guys, a lot of like local musicians would get up and jam with us, you know, and it, it was funny, you know. Chris, Christian Brady was in Hell Yeah was like when he was just like, I think he was just almost a teenager, <laughs> like yeah. He would jam these all these guys would jam with us. You know? He's a like, shredder, man. You know, yeah. Um, God, all these. Who else? I'm thinking. One of the drummers who was in like otherwise, or one of these bands like otherwise, or one of these like kind of local big bands that got signed. 
But yeah, you guys would be coming yeah. through uh, Vamp. You'd be bringing in giant artists with you and stuff. Oh yeah, like yeah, that. that was cool too. That was kind of our gimmick, you know. We'd just yeah. bring, and we'd always have a guest, you know. Yeah, that was a that was a great staple you guys invented yeah. with that man. Yeah, we'd like, have you get a, to see like Chris um, Holmes from Wasp. Oh yeah. The, My favorite was when you bring Sebastian Bach. In. Sebastian Bach. I was always yeah, a huge yeah, Skid yeah, Row yeah. fan, and all of a sudden there's there's Baz on stage yeah, yeah, doing Skid that. Row songs, and it's just yeah. like ah. For me, it was a challenge too because, like I said, when I was growing up, I never was like into the shredding stuff. Like I was just like Keith. I was into Keith Richards and like Johnny, and I was a punk rock kid, so I was playing like Ramon songs, three chord songs, and I'd like Keith Richards, you know, just the bend here, one note, you know. So I was never into like. Even though I liked that stuff, I never was, like, tried to learn, like, Yngwie Malmsteen. You know what I mean? I was never yeah. into, like... Um, so for me, having, like, these bands come in, like, we had Kip Winger one time, and we had to do, like, a Winger song. And I remember I had to learn, like, a Red Beach solo. And Red Beach Red is, Beach. like, fuck, a monster guitar player. Oh, yeah. So those things made me better because I'd have to, like, take time. Like, But for me, maybe somebody else might be able to learn a, a really good, good, great guitar player could probably learn in a day or two, you know, a day. You know, even Zach Throne, give me an Eddie Van Halen solo, he could probably learn it in a, in a few hours. Where yeah. me, I'd have to put it on this little guitar train and I'd work on it for a week, you know, what <laughs> I mean? just like every day until I get it, you know. Uh, but that was cool. It made me definitely, playing with all those different players made me, I think, a better musician. Absolutely. Because you know? I would look back, there were some videos, like I said, when we had people, like I can remember when we had like Kip Winger, um, He's a me, stickler too. Yeah, yeah, and me playing with him, and and I knew that too. And these guys are so pro that sometimes, and then you'd rehearse so much because you don't want to disappoint them either. Yeah, you know what I mean, yeah, um, they're coming to have fun. George Lynch. Oh, uh, George, one. you guys used to have George Lynch all the time. Often, yeah. I was actually stoked about that. I got to work with him so many times. He started, like, he knew who I was, which yeah, was, yeah. for me was like, oh, George Lynch knows who I am. I'm a huge Dawkins fan. Yeah, yeah. That was one of my closet bands where I was just like, yeah, I love We Dawkin. had him so many times. Um, God. So we have to play Mr. that song, Mr. Scary, which is like a crazy instrumental, one of the harder instrumental songs, you know, by him called Mr. Scary. And it's there's no lyrics to guide you. Yeah. So it's just a complete instrumental where he's just jamming. And the thing about the song is that no parts repeat. It's all just like each part changes. It's a new part all the way through. And nothing is even, too. It's not like four bars. Four, you know, a lot of times the songs are like, here's an eight-bar part, you know, and then there's the eight-bar verse, and then the eight, whatever. It's even parts, you know, and maybe you have a four-bar, you know what I mean? But it goes back to the eight bars. But with hit, with that song, Mr. Scary, it's like four bars here, five bars here, six bars, back to two bars. I mean, and each part's different. So learning that song was like, oh, my God. And um, so I would write like a cheat sheet, you know, like part A, part B, part, you know, I'd put the bar. How many bars? A lot. Or if it was a weird chord change, I'd make a note on my little paper, like go to the you know, G down to the F, you know, minor there. And I'd write a note. So I'd have, and I knew the song well enough that I could get through it, but I just had him there almost like a um, security blanket, you know, like, Oh yeah. Just feel better. I'd have them. And they're on, and I never put them up high. They'd always be on the floor. So the crowd couldn't see that I had no, no. So I had, so one time I'm jamming. Oops. Oh, one time I'm jamming. <laughs> and George Lance is, over there with, he's got a cigarette out of his, hanging out of his mouth, and he comes up to jam with me, and he doesn't know, and so he sticks his foot right, like, he comes over to jam with me, and he sticks his foot right on my notes while he's jamming, you know? Like, yeah, like, if these were the notes, he's just got, he plants his foot, just, <laughs> just like that. Uh. And I'm like, and it's like the beginning of the song, and he's just jamming, and his foot's right, and he doesn't have no idea, you know? And he's got a cigarette, so I can't even, like, you know what I mean? The smoke's coming out, and my eyes get smoky, and I'm trying to play this Mr. Scare song, and I'm just like, it's like that scene in, in Star Wars where, like, they put the blindfold on Luke Skywalker, and they, like, just use the force. You yeah. Know? I just said, okay, Brett, 
<laughs> just use the force. <laughs> and I remember getting through it and just going, oh. and I made it through without a mistake, but it was like, but, and that was probably the fifth time, it might have been the fourth or fifth time we had jammed with them. So I needed the song, but I just still need, it was such a crazy hard song. Because a couple times we had fucking screwed the song up. We played one time at Wasted Space inside the Hard Rock yeah. there. And it wasn't my fault, but I think who screwed it up? Someone we had, I think we had a guy on the bass who screwed it up before Michael Ellis was in the band. I don't, I, I forget the details, but I remember we fucked it up and it was like, and George Lynch was cool. He's like, oh, you know, I'm sure so many people have fucked that song up, but um. Yeah, he's he's a pretty laid back guy. I mean, yeah, he was pre, he was funny. Had a really funny sense of humor, a real kind of dry yeah sense of humor. So yeah, I liked him. He was really funny. Um, where a lot of people, you know, we got to jam with Lemmy right before you know before he passed away. He's a wild man. Yeah, was a wild man. He used to hang out at Dive Bar all the time. Yeah, and you'd have to watch your drinks around that guy because yeah, he'd yeah. sneak like meth into your drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, dude, what are you yeah, doing? That's crazy. not cool. He's like, yeah. if I'm gonna be up all night, you're gonna be up all yeah, night yeah, with yeah. me. And it's just yeah. like, oh my god. Yeah, we got to we that band. We had, we jammed with a lot of really cool people. Um, I remember one night too. New York Dolls played downtown on Fremont somewhere. At a venue there, and it was sold. That was sold out. And I remember Sammy Yaffa, the bass player, and I think um, the guitar player who who passed away recently, Sylvain Sylvain. They came down to the dive bar and they got up and jammed with us. And I remember, every, I remember the dive bar was just so packed that night because everybody that saw them there somehow word got out they were going to come jam with us in city centers. And I remember the dive bar was like friggin' packed i mean you couldn't even like there were people that couldn't get in it was just like hanging out in the parking lot and and that was a great thing because you could be in the parking lot and still hear the music oh and, yeah and see and see inside you know that was a cool cool thing yeah yeah i used to live at that old dive bar that was yeah. my that was my favorite spot in the, all all of vegas <laughs> yeah I, was, I, I had some wild times that really crazy times that's the place to have them, man. They oh just God. don't care. You can just do whatever you want and go completely I nuts had, there. I had this young girlfriend. I remember I brought her in there. It was like a night off. <laughs> Where, you know how the, the old dive bar, there was like the bar area? Yeah. And there was a stage area. And the stage area was kind of separated by that little kind of wall. But anyways, there's no bands in there. So the bar area was kind of full of lights around. But the stage area back there had some tables. And it was like, just me and her were in there. And she's like... I remember she went underneath the table, was going down on me. Yeah. Back there, nobody's back there. I'm like alone in that separate room. But I can remember the bartender. Like it was so funny because I think it was, his name was Taro. Yeah, Taro. Taro. Yeah. Taro Dactyl. I remember Taro like walked in the room to use the restroom or something. But he, he was like, <laughs> <laughs> all he saw was like me. I'm just sitting there, and this girl's hands going like this, and he's just like. <laughs> thumbs up. But yeah, Tarot, so, you gonna stop that? Yeah, he just gave me like thumbs up. But yeah, um, wild, yeah, wild times, you know. Oh, bro, yeah, some of the best times of my of yeah. my life were in that bar, man. Yeah, I have some just, just complete some debauchery. Good, good, good memories, like I said, and you know, I didn't even expect that girl to do that. I was just like sitting there, and she was just wild. You know what I mean? I'm like. Holy, I, I like, there's people in the bar. Like, we're in the, we're, we're, you know, we're just like the next room over. It's open. The top of it's like open, you know. Yeah. What I mean? so people, are, you know, and it's running from the bar on the other side. They couldn't even see, they could only see my head. So they're probably like, well, where did that chick went that he, that he was with, you know? She Jeez. just disappeared down below the table, you know. Yeah, I remember Wild Ron, shit. Ron Jeremy used to come in there all the time, and then eventually they actually ended up like filming a porn in the dive bar. Oh, wow. Yeah. He uh, got in big trouble, boy. Oh, yeah. He's like in jail now, I guess. He's got like... Oh, Ron Jeremy did? Oh, yeah, he's sitting oh, in jail. He's sitting in jail right now in L.A. He's got like 14 counts of like sexual... Something crazy, like, like maybe 12... To or 14, I don't know, a lot of girls have came out and basically... Oh, 20 sexual assault charges. Wow, 20! Holy guacamole! He's in big fucking trouble. Ron Jeremy. But what's weird is back in the 80s, I always tell people, the shit we did back then is not acceptable these days. You know what I mean? No, like, you couldn't get away with you it, You can't man. get away, you yeah. know. And what's sad, I mean, partly what's sad 
I, I, I don't feel totally bad if he did some shit without permission, but um, some of the stuff he did is just like, that's just what they did in the eight. That's what he did in the eighties. You know, he's like yeah. a, he's a creature of that. You know what I mean? But yeah, you can't. I mean, like when I was touring with Faster, the girls would do that. So, I mean, we didn't have to. Girls would come up and do shit to us. You know what I mean? Wow, that's crazy, man. Ron Jeremy. He's in big trouble. I mean, if I mean, it's with a, that many charges too, he. I doubt he'll be able to get out of all of them. You know? It says two hundred and fifty years in prison. And but, he's old. And he's old too now. Yeah. He's got to be seventies, right? Oh man, yeah, and he he was fucking around with the fifteen year old. Yeah, says. he's in big. Yeah, he trouble. screwed over that one. It's one thing to be like, oh, you yeah, know, yeah, you had yeah, a sexual yeah. encounter with Ron Jeremy, but it's like fucking fifteen year old. Yeah, that's hard. It's gonna be hard to get out of that. Yeah, that's crazy. But yeah. I always tell people, I'm like, the shit we did, like when we were faster pussycat, it was like all that stuff was like sort of like expected almost it was like sex drugs and rock and roll yeah. groupies would come around and they were expecting to get on the back of the bus and 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 orgies were expected it was like it was kind of a normal thing yeah and nobody was like getting in trouble nobody was like saying you did this without permission it was like i would never force it i never in my life would ever force somebody to do but i mean we were doing shit and like I said, that would just not fly nowadays. You know what I mean? It was like, oh yeah, you know. I mean, it's crazy. Orgies even... on the back of the bus, and like, we were young too. Some of those girls were probably pretty young. We weren't checking IDs. You know what I mean? Some of these girls, you know, I'm sure there's 16 year olds coming around. You know? Yeah, you never but know, man. That's just catching up to a lot of people. I mean, I'm kind of like, in some ways, like I'm glad I was able to be a rock star in the 80s. Because now it would be much more difficult because with this, everything's got to be politically correct, right? Yeah. It would be way harder nowadays. You know, you'd have to like be really careful. Even Marilyn Manson's in big trouble. A lot of the shit that was like acceptable for him to do. Oh, I didn't know Manson got in trouble too. Oh, and he's they're after big, everybody. Big, yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, the stuff Manson was, is, was doing was almost acceptable like 20 years ago. You know what I mean? In the 90s, when he first came out, all that st a lot of the stuff that he was doing was almost like, I don't say acceptable, but it was like taller. You know what I mean? It was like, it was almost part of his shtick. You know what I mean? Like bondage, kind of bondage type stuff. And Yeah, yeah. It says... Uh... He's in big trouble though too. Has been accused of abuse by multiple women, allegations ranging from sexual assault to psychological abuse. Well, it's like, if you're going to fuck around with Manson, I mean, it's probably going to be some psychological abuse. Yeah, that yeah, guy's that's out what I mean. Uh, he, he almost like, <laughs> yeah. that's what they were saying. It was like, he's almost made his career on being like kind of abuse, you know, abusive. Yeah. It's, and uh, kind of bonded. That was like his, what he was kind of about almost. It's crazy, dark, man. Dark, dark sex stuff. But... That's what I'm saying. This stuff doesn't fly anymore. Yeah, and it's <laughs> like, are they? It's not like he's raping these women, is it? I mean, they're just they had sex with well, them, and now of they them, some feel of them, bad about it for some reason. Well, some of them have came out and said that he did. Some of them have said have said that he did rape them. Yeah, but you know, it's hard to you know, unless you're there. I mean, or there's video. I mean. Some of that stuff's going to be hard to prove, especially some of them came out years later. You know. Yeah. That's crazy. Some of them, I believe, the the girl who's the actress Evelyn, I think Wood or something. Yeah. She was on Westworld. She came out. She dated him for a while. She came out and basically said he kind of psychologically abused her and and was really bad. And uh, after she came out, a bunch of other girls came out. Oh yeah, but it was Evan like, Rachel Wood. Evelyn Rachel Wood, right? Yeah. And I believe her, but I mean, you know, it's like you date Manson. Kind of, what do you expect? Like you're saying, what do you expect? What do you expect? <laughs> The guy's fucking crazy, man. You know, yeah. he's notorious for uh, all kinds of insane. A couple things. of his band members though came out and said, "Yeah, he's an asshole." And he, he is an asshole. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's a freak. I mean, you can see it. Like, I went and saw him play. I've seen him a bunch of times. And the last time I've seen him, right? yeah, 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 he's like throwing. He's smashing monitors and mm. throwing mic stands at the engineer and like just totally disregarding his show to go belittle people on on his crew and. Yeah, yeah he's a jerk. He um. 
I have a funny mountain story. I went to Japan one time. I'm trying to think. I might have been over there already, and I think I just stayed longer. I had a, a Japanese girlfriend over there, and she was friends with, like, Backyard Babies guys and Wild Hearts, and they were opening for Marilyn Manson, I think Backyard Babies and Wild Hearts, and they had, I think, Michael Monroe from Hannah Rocks with them. But I remember going on a bus with her up to Mount Fuji on, I think I was on Backyard Babies bus with Michael Monroe. It was really cool. And um, there's a whole other part of the story. It was fine. I mean, the record company lady tried to kick me off because it was like the band bus. But I'm like, I'm friends with them. They invited me. And like, I had to fight with this Japanese record company lady <laughs> about staying on their bus because I go, I'm going to go jam with them up at Mount Fuji. Yeah. If you kick me off the bus, there's no way I'm going to get all the way three hours away up to Mount Fuji on my own. I go, I, I, they invited me. I'm not getting off the bus. I was like arguing with this. Yeah. And because of insurance or whatever, because these Japanese, they, like they have rules there. They don't like to bend rules, you know? Absolutely. In America, we kind of, I always say in America, we were, we've kind of, America was built on breaking rules, you know? I mean, ever from the beginning, ever since the very beginning, when we told England, when when we were a colony of England, we told England to go fuck themselves. Yeah. We've been, we are like rebels. We've always had a rebel spirit. You know what I mean? Um, we even fought each other in the Civil War. You know what yeah. I mean? But we've always built, you know, everything in America. I mean, if you look at like people like, um, you know, like the movie Rebel Without a Cause with James Dean, you know, or the Fonz, you know, the leather jacket. We've always been rebels. So we, I think America has a culture of like kind of breaking like we have rules, but they're kind of like meant, meant to be broken. Kinda. When we can, when you can. Yeah. If it's safe or you know, or if this rule doesn't, you know what I mean? It's like people do it all the time. It's just how we are. But in Japan, it's not like that. They have like it's very much collective society. And if you don't follow rules, you're kind of looked down on. You know, so everybody's has a lot yeah. more pressure. Even Takashi, like I said, his way of working, so different. But anyways, I'm finding with this Japanese day, I finally stay on the bus. But to make a long story short, we get up to Mount Fuji, and those guys are opening for Marilyn Manson. And they're not allowed to look at Marilyn Manson or go near his backstage. And they go, he's a total... They were calling him Brian Warner. His real name's Brian Oh, yeah, Brian Warner, Warner yeah. They're going he was at, like a fanboy for a long time, doing interviews with musicians and stuff like that as Ryan well, Warner. Well, it was weird. He came to Faster Pussycat show. He was a fan. He, and before he was big and got signed, when he was in Florida, and I think he had a band called the Spooky Kid. It was like Marilyn Manson, the Spooky Kid. Yeah. Before he was signed, <clears throat> he had came to a, a Faster Pussycat show. He was a fan. So, But later when he got big, he kind of got like, it's almost like now it's my turn to be the asshole now that I'm famous. You know what I mean? It's almost like the bully who gets bullied when he's younger but then turns mm. into be a bully when he gets in the power position. Yeah. But he was there going, he's the biggest asshole. And I go, really? And then I heard a story like where he punched John. He went, uh, his guitar player was John Five. He just punched out of no reason. He just punched him on stage, just decked him. And I'm like, wow, you, you know, I heard that story. I go, this guy's an asshole. Yeah, John Five is like the sweetest guy, yeah, too. Yeah, he punched him one time just on stage. But I just, all these stories, and I'm like, so I'm like, okay. And, and they go, he's an asshole. And then when you watch his live, you could see him being a jerk. He would like yeah. belittle people or he'd, he'd be mean or he'd do something shitty, like ruin something. Because he's got the money, because he's famous, he can probably afford to, replace the monitor pay for the monitor afterwards but still you could just see he's just being a jerk right and he's you could see there's something to it like i, I go wow there's something to the show and there's something cool about it but there's something very dark and not nice there's something kind of like not really good <laughs> you know what i mean yeah he's, not nice. he's got a really bad attitude there's about a bad it there's something crew. bad there you know almost almost evil but just just not good and not nice you could just see there's like there's a lot of abuse where he'll abuse somebody you know you could see him being abusive and then um so we played and everything and then it was like the next day we we're in tokyo <clears throat> and um the girls hang out with she goes the guys are going to there was a famous like rock club where rock bands would go to called the lexington queen in rapungi and she goes Backyard Babies and Michael Monroe and Wild Hearts are all going to Lexington Queen. It's a day off. So I go, cool, I'm going there. So I got there early with her. <clears throat> and um, 
there was hardly anybody in the club. A couple Japanese girls, there's bartender. There's a VIP room where the rock stars go and hang out. And then sometimes the owner would bring in these models from America, you know, American models that are in Japan modeling. They bring them in when the rock bands come in. But when I got there, I was got there early. And I go to the VIP room. I was just going to have a drink. And I'd been in the VIP room many times from, you know, when I was in Faster Pussycat. You know what I mean? But this was later. This is after. This is like, I'm not in Faster anymore. This is later, like around 2000 or something, 2001, 2002. So I go into the VIP room, and there's a big, big, huge, look like football player, black guy. And he stops me going into the thing. I'm like, this is kind of weird. I go, my name is Bryn. I'm, I'm here. I'm going to meet the other band guys, the backyard babies. You know, I should be in there. I'm, and, and I didn't say I'm in Faster Pussy. I didn't, I never been like that, but I'm just like, you know, I'm in a band or whatever. I've been in there many times. And he goes, you can't go in there. And I look in and there's nobody in there except fucking Marilyn Manson sitting there. And he sees me. I'm at the door, and there's, like, wind, open windows and stuff. Yeah. He sees me, and he's with Twiggy, and I know fucking he recognizes me. I know. Because, I mean, at the time, I look more like I did then. You know, I have long hair and stuff, and um, got my rock clothes on and stuff. And he sees me, <clears throat> and he's in there with Twiggy, just those two guys. And they're laughing because they're, they're, that's their security who's blocking the door. But there's no one in there. It's not like they're partying with girls or anything. It's just those two guys sitting there, and they start laughing. At, they're enjoying that I can't get in. Yeah. I'm thinking, what a fucking just asshole. Dickheads. He knows. And this is a guy who's seen my band before. You know what I mean? It probably was a fan, but now that he's big Marilyn Manson, he's too cool. And I'm, I'm, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to let Brent Muscat in. And, and they're laughing. I could see them kind of laughing about it. And I could see the way they're talking. They're like, <laughs> like, they know who I am, and they're laughing. So I'm like, motherfuckers. And I'm pissed. Yeah. Like, what? I go, he really is a jerk. There's no need that he needed to do that. You know, and then laugh at me, kind of laugh at me that I couldn't get in. <clears throat> and I was really mad. I looked at the fucking guy, and I, I was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a lot younger. You know, this is like, fuck, like two, 2001 or something. So I'm so fucking mad. So I go uh, to the front bar. And the guys from the band, Backyard Babies and Wild Hearts and Michael Monroe, they come in, and of course they, there's nobody in there except Marilyn Manson, so they didn't go in there. They all, we all group at the front bar, and we are just fucking partying up there. There's music going on, there's a jukebox, you know, then there's Japanese girls hanging out, and we're all fucking partying and stuff, and it's so funny because like an hour later, nobody went in the room with them, and those two guys came out later like this. And then looked in like, just like loser, like two losers, like there's where the party's at. You losers are going home <laughs> alone. You know what I mean? But it yeah. was like, I laugh. We were all laughing. They were all laughing too. Like, look who's leaving, you know? And like, it serves them right. You know, you guys have such a fucking fun time in the VIP room alone. But that was my experience with Mary Lance. So I always knew this guy's a fucking not not a really nice guy. And I heard so many stories, you know. Got you a water, homie. Oh, thank you. But I heard so thank many you. stories from so many different people where it's just like, it's all bad, you know. No, nothing good, you know. I've never heard in any good stories about Manson. Mm -hmm. No, not not at all, man. Yeah. All, only horror stories about yeah, him yeah. mistreating everybody. Yeah. So, yeah. Really abusive, yeah. So it doesn't surprise me with the, with the stuff, but he's in big trouble now, too. I mean... But yeah, Ron Jeremy's actually sitting in jail though, waiting oh. for like trial. You know, that sucks. He's he's such a fun dude to hang out yeah. with too, man. And and a lot of that sexual stuff, allegations against a porn star is kind of crazy to me. Well, honestly. a lot of that stuff he was just that was his life. I yeah. mean, it was like that's just what he did. I yeah. mean, that's how he made a living. But now, like, you get in trouble for it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I mean, what like Harvey Weinstein? That's that's, that's a different little that's different, a different story. thing. Yeah, yeah a he was he was story. abusing women and yeah. definitely fuck that guy. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think some of it. it but just what's weird? Even with, I'm crazy. not excusing Harvey Weinstein at all, but at the time, some of that shit was probably. No, I mean, for those type of guys, that shit was kind of normal. Like, yeah, I'm in this power position as a producer for films. And I get to sleep with hot actresses because they want a job. Yeah. That's just kind of what he did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not making an excuse, but it was like a lot of people were doing that. And it wasn't as like, 
I guess it was bad. I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying that just shit happened more. And I don't know. People, I guess there wasn't. In, I mean, now it's just it that wasn't shit. a secret. That, yeah, that it was wasn't going a on. It was like, either. yeah, you want a hot role, you can go bang a producer yeah, and get and a you role have in the to, movie. Or you could, or you could yeah. not. You know yeah. what I mean? But he had the power to like fucking whatever, give girl, make girls star people stars or not. Yeah. So yeah, and, I mean, some of the shit that for is like sexual favors is kind of fucked up. Yeah, it's yeah. fucked up. But I mean, like that shit happened with other people. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just like, like I said, some of the stuff. Like I, I look back at, like I said, the the years with Faster Pussycat. We never, I never did anything like uh, where, where, like, force people to do something. Like, That's bad. Never anything like that. But just some of the stuff we did just wouldn't fly these days. You no. know what I mean? It was like a different time. Well, and people are looking you know? for fame, man. You know, they're yeah. looking for that, uh, that chance to go, uh, oh, well, I had a sexual encounter with this person, regardless. With this famous person, yeah, yeah. Regardless if it was uh, consensual or not, they're right. like, I can get famous by complaining about right, it. Right, yeah, right. That's that's kind of a mess. I mean, you, you saw what happened with like Aziz is like the classic. All right, it's going too far here, you know. Which with who? who Aziz Ansari. What happened with him? He went out uh, with this chick he met on Tinder or whatever, uh-huh. and I mean, she blew him a couple times and. They didn't really have a great time on like the third date or something. Uh-huh. And she goes, "Oh well, n- now it turns into that's rape." Oh, I you see. You know, yeah. and it's like Aziz didn't fucking rape you. You right, know, right, you're right. just you you hung out with the famous person who has a penis, and now you want to try to yeah. you know take well, that's advantage the thing. of that. I think there are legit. I think there's there are times when it's legit. There's and tons I of think, legit ones. Yeah, yeah but I think absolutely. there are times when they when some people are claiming rape when it's not. You yeah, know, they wake up the next day and they regret it. And they're going to say, you know, rape or something, which is like, you know. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's it, it goes too, it's too much sometimes. Yeah. Know? And sometimes they do it just as a threat and everything. I mean, there's yeah, there going to yeah, be yeah. consequences about fake rape allegations, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, like there's no, they can do this, they can throw that word all around and completely ruin someone's life. Yeah, that's the And then there's no, there's no recourse at all. It's just like, oh, well, that didn't happen. I guess we all move on. Except for him, his reputation's ruined. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, it's screwed up. Yeah. Yeah, but and it's, I always it's think, up. Yeah, I always think you got to give some people the benefit of the doubt, you know? Yeah. Or people should be innocent until proven guilty, you know, yeah. because you never know, you know, like with Manson, he's kind of obvious, like where, you know, he's a bad dude, you yeah. know what I mean? So the, there's a lot of obvious stuff there, but I'm sure there could be some of the, I mean, I mean, some of those people are legit, like Evelyn Rachel Wood, I believe her, maybe, you know, but I mean, there could be a couple of the ones that are accusing him of that just might be mad at him or whatever, or might. Yeah. Like you said, bro- bad breakup or something, or pissed off because he left you for, you know, he left you and you went with that girl. Now you're mad, so you're just going to jump on the hole. Yeah, you know? it happened 10, 15 years ago, and yeah. it's like, why, you know. It's but just, yeah, Ron Jeremy, that's another one. He it. is like, I read this shit, and I'm just like, I'd see him do some of that stuff, like, He'd be at the Hard Rock, and there'd be one of those um, AVN conventions. Yeah, that shit gets wild, man. And girls would get in hotel rooms, but some of the girls want to, you know, they'd, they'd go up to him and go, can I touch it? Yeah. They, they'd ask him that. And so he's just like, almost like that's his life. He was like, he grew up with that. And now it's like, fuck, you know what I mean? This, I shouldn't have, I should have checked her ID. I guess. That yeah. one's ID, you know what I mean? Like. Yeah, that's kind of fucked up there for sure, man. Yeah, yeah, it's scary out there, man. Yeah, gotta... it's definitely. I mean, it's definitely. And I'm glad though. Like, I made it. Like, I had my time in the '80s and had my fun. But I'm kind of glad I made it out of there and kind of like change. I mean, like, I'm glad I'm not a rock star. Like a like a touring rock star. I mean, you yeah. Know? I guess once a rock star, always a rock star. But I'm glad I'm not living it these days. You know, I'm kind of like mellowed out you know what I mean I'm not out chasing chicks and I'm not you know what I mean I'm not partying like I used to and um or touring on a bus you know what I mean and yeah there's not tons of group there's not the temptation of all the groupies coming around you know what I mean but and I'm glad I like I said in the when I was able to do it in the late 80s early 90s a lot of that stuff was like fuck that's just kind of what everybody did. even the girls would I mean they were That's the why ones they go that, to the concert. Yeah, a lot of them came to the concert because they wanted to hook up with the rock guy. Yeah, you know? it's bragging rights, man. Yeah, I remember we did an in-store, and these girls came in bikinis. It's like Texas. <laughs> in the summer, we're doing a record in-store signing, and like signing people are in line, and these fucking couple girls are in bikinis. Yeah. 
I'm like, wow, and beautiful. I mean, I don't know how old they are. I hope that, I mean, I was probably 19. They yeah. might have been 18, you know, but I don't, I wasn't checking. But they were the ones who like got me out. They got, they, I remember they got me and the bus was empty because we all had hotel rooms. So all the guys are in the hotel rooms and they're like, oh, we, two girls, they go, we want to bring you, we want to hang out with you on the back of the bus. They're in bikinis. I'm like, all right, let's go. I knew what was good, you know what I mean? But they were the ones that go, we want to go on your bus and hang out with you. And yeah. basically, we, we want to have a you know a threesome with you. Basically, I was like. Oh, you poor, you poor man. You know, but that shit just wouldn't fly nowadays. You know what I mean? It's no. not like. Look what happened know. to Louis C.K., man, you know? Right, right. The chick goes up to his hotel room with him. Uh-huh. And he he pulls his he doesn't even touch he pulls his dick out starts jerking off and right. now it's like rape back these allegations and right. shit like that and it's well, like he's famous, he went so up I mean, to his hotel room with him what was the well, there implications might have been a, of all that the thing with him is there might there was probably a time where somebody because he's famous you know yeah. there's probably some girl probably came up and probably had told him before can I come up to your hotel and they might have even asked him to do that yeah so he could have done that a few times and with some girls. It was probably a thrill or it might have been fine. But yeah, you do that shit just doesn't fly. No. That's what I'm saying. It's like some of that stuff would be like girls would want you to do that. You know what I mean? It'd be like, like you said, bragging rights. You know, I was with this rock star, you know. Yeah. David Lee Roth. Oh my God. Oh no. David Lee Roth story. Those are the craziest stories. So we're on tour with David. David Lee Roth was one of the first tours we did. <laughs> Uh, so I we barely ever we saw all the other guys. I mean, Steve Vai was in the band. And we'd we'd be playing, and Steve Vai was on the side watching us play, like in the monitor area and stuff. You know, we barely we'd see Dave walk by, but he had his own backstage, and he was his limo. He's a rock star. You know, we barely ever see Dave. So the whole tour, we don't see Dave. Now it's the last day of the tour, and his crew goes, "Hey, Dave wants to throw a part, a throwing away party, going away party, for you guys." We go, okay. And it's in the back, you know, it's these arenas. So you're in like an area where it's like a locker room, you know, where backstage, it's like locker rooms and showers and areas, you know, because it's like a sports arena or whatever we're playing. And um, so we get in there and it's like, they've got like it all done up, like disco lights and stuff going on. They've got like a little tiny PA with pumping like a DJ set up, music going and stuff. And, um, we get in there, and we're in, like, they get us in a room, and it's, like, just us standing around, and um, we're, like, okay, what do we do? And the guys from Daily Ross Band there and us that are there. They go, hold on, Dave, we'll be right in. So we go, okay, and the music's going, and Dave comes in. <laughs> and he's got a train conductor, like a train, you know, the hat yeah. with the stripes. Oh, and, yeah. like, the overalls you know like the one fucking goober you know what I'm t- what do they call that thing it's like an overall thing with the oh it's yeah. a one piece with the train conduct- it's like a train uniform on like a train conductor he comes in and he's got a fucking i never i don't know how he did it he has a joint it's like this big it's like a cigar oh. and he brings this joint in the and he gets us in a room and he fucking lights it up and we start we get in a circle and he goes, get in a circle. He's like conducting everything. <laughs> and he's not even really like going, hey, it's nice to have you on the tour. He's just like, <laughs> it's like a show. Uh, so he gets this fucking thing. He lights it up. Hey, guys. Great having you on tour here. And so I take a hit, gave it to my like other guitar player, Greg, and then like, you know, singer and all the guys. We're taking it. And I'm like, fuck. I get, I'm like high. And then all of a sudden, Dave goes, one second and the music's going he fucking brings in we're in upstate New York and he brings in these two strippers they had to be strippers I guess because they come in and they've got like you know a little bikini they've got bikinis on he brings these two strippers in and he starts dancing with them like we're in a big circle he's like dancing with these two strippers and we're you know, this is just kind of, and where I'm, I'm high, so I'm just like, it's kind of weird. I mean, there's, you know, a going away party, you think he would, hey, you know, get to know us or like be personal. It's just like him putting on a show. Yeah. Not the real, I don't know who the David, the David Lee Roth we're seeing is just the rock star. Like, this is not like the real David Lee Roth. It's just like he's putting on a show for us. So he's dancing with the strippers and he takes, one of them, he might have took both, but he takes one. He goes, one second, guys. He takes one, and he takes her into the, 
like showers where we can't see, takes her back there. So we go, okay, he's probably doing something with her, you know. And um, this is so gross. I don't even know if I could say this, but so oh, he do it. <laughs> <laughs> he, so he brings a girl in. And even this, for me, it's even too much. I mean, this was like, it grossed me out. It freaked me and my other guitar player. We even left pretty soon. We kind of like go, hey, let's, let's get out of here. But anyways, he takes one girl back. He brings her in there. And it seemed like 30 seconds. I'm like, I don't know. I think he might have had like some kind of like lotion or something hidden on him. Like, because he yeah. brings this girl back and he brings her back. He's in there. It seemed like 30 seconds. He might have been in there. It might have been two minutes. I don't know, but it was like not long. He brings her back out and he turns her to us and there's all this stuff dripping off her back. God damn. <laughs> I'm like, and he show, he's like showing her off. He like yeah. takes her and he takes her back and he shows it to all of us. And he's like pointing like, and even I just felt, that is like. <laughs> Why, David? It's like, I don't need to see that. <laughs> you know what I mean? The guy's that's an for, animal. That's for me that's too much, though. I'm like, yeah. this is fucking too much, you know? So he does that, and the girls are dancing. They don't know that it's, I guess, because it's body temperature or whatever. Yeah. But she, I guess she doesn't know. Maybe it's his trick. He likes. Yeah. To, it's like his party trick Yeah. that he did for And But I was just like, this is the fucking weirdest thing. <laughs> I go. Let's get the fuck out. I remember getting back on the bus and just going, oh, my God. I, that, I, I go, I'll never forget that is the weirdest thing that's ever happened. What a creeper. But it really creepy, you know? <laughs> and I remember just thinking, but there was no goodbye. I just remember going, uh, I think it's time to get out of here. And maybe yeah. a couple of other guys hung out and st stayed around. But I remember going to Greg, I go, I'm heading back to the bus. This is fucking weird. <laughs> It's so weird. But I always think maybe he had like a fucking um, thing of lotion and maybe squirted on her back yeah, or something. Was it was fucking just, with you guys. Maybe. I don't know. It's just fucking weird, though. Uh, but I always thought he wasn't going to like fuck around with her because like he wanted to fuck around with her. It was like he was doing it like putting on a show for us, you know? Yeah. And I just thought that's so weird. That dude did a lot of cocaine, man. Mm. He was out of his friggin' mind all the time. That one, though, freaked me out, though, because it was just like, fuck, we don't see this guy, like, the whole tour, and the last night he does that, and, like, and it was just so weird, but it was just a show. I mean, from him, his train conductor's outfit, and the lights going on, the music, and this fucking, and of course we were high, because this fucking joint was, like, huge, and I'm like, this is so weird. <laughs> That's but wild, yeah, that man. was a, that was weird. I, yeah, the, I, I have some fond memories of all the uh, bands we toured with. Kiss was another funny one, you know. Eating like you, we, you know, eating lunch with you know, you'd be at the gig, you'd eat like dinner with Gene Simmons backstage, you know, catering, you know, and he's telling you know, save your money, you know, buy stock. He, he's like, <laughs> we're like young rock guys and we want to party with chicks, and he's like talking about like stocks uh, and stuff. You know? it's, yeah, like, funny, you know. That's awesome, man. Well, you know what? We're just past the uh, the two hour mark, man. Oh, good. We've been we've talking been talking hours, forever, yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you got some amazing stories. Bro. Oh, I have a ton. You know, I'll have to come back on and tell you more. Cause I, I would was, love that. You know, I've got a ton. <laughs> you know, the, like I said, we toured with Motley, Kiss, and and each one, I, I there's like, especially like that David Lee Roth. That one stands out because it's just so weird and <laughs> kind of gross. I mean, it's almost like. You know, I'm pretty open-minded, and, like, there's nothing wrong, but I just always thought that was, like, weird, you know? Yeah, who's that for? Yeah, it was He's, like... Like, you want to see that shit, yeah, why you know? Do, why do you want to see yeah, that? I don't want to see that. Go have fun, David. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it was just weird, because and he was in there for, like, it seems so quick. I was like, how is that humanly... If that's, like, real, how is that humanly possible? <laughs> yeah, especially for a crazy dude like that <laughs> yeah. who's probably getting laid all the mm. time. Yeah, it was weird. It was real weird. But yeah, we, you know, all kinds of like, you know, I was, you know, like I, I, I usually, I have a pretty good story for like every band we tour. Like even like the Manson thing was a funny story where we were, you know, where they were in that VIP room and laughing because I couldn't get in. But by the end of the night, they were the ones walking out with like, you know, nobody went in to hang out with them, you know, and Shit. it was weird. Well, we definitely got to have you back on the podcast yeah, again, definitely. man. Yeah, definitely. I really enjoyed hanging out with you. This it's has been fun, fantastic, yeah. man. It's fun, yeah. So, well, I'd really like to thank my guest, 
Brent Muscat. Thank you. You're amazing, man. Fantastic story. You can always edit or beep anything out. No right way, man. No <laughs> editing. Feelings too. I tried not to be too graphic. You know what I mean? But oh, I put the I push the explicit button. People yeah, yeah, know yeah, we're yeah, gonna yeah, say yeah, naughty yeah. words. Yeah. So, well, yeah, this has been uh, another episode of To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. Hit that uh, subscribe button. Give us a like. Hit ring the bell. All that good stuff. Follow us on social media. And, uh, yeah. Cool. Peace. Thanks for having me on. Dude, you're the man. Thank you. That yeah. was great. Yeah, that was funny. Yeah, we toured with Motley. When we toured with Motley, it was funny because they just got clean. So, like... Tommy Lee would come backstage, like into our room, and go, "What are you guys doing?" Nothing. We're just hanging out. And he goes, "I don't know, dude. We're, we, I'm not doing drugs anymore, so I don't know. What do you guys do?" Oh, we're doing, God. Well, I'm just, we're just hanging out back here, get waiting to go on stage. He's like, "I just don't know." He, it was so he was so funny because they had, like I said, had just quit doing drugs, so he was like, he didn't know what to do with himself. He was like, had so much energy. He was like, you know, come back. I always remember that was my impression, Tommy. That's a hard spot to be at. Tommy's like a little kid, man. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, yeah. With him, he's just, he's bouncing around, yeah, yeah. man. But I remember he had come backstage and being like, like, what are you guys doing back here? Like, not much, really. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we'd have like our amp set up. You know, maybe we'd have our guitar to warm up on or whatever before we go on. We're just warming up. It's like, I don't know what to do. I drank five cups of coffee. I'm all wired. I, I can't do. It. You know, they had, like, no more booze. They weren't doing booze or they quit heroin. You know, they had been doing heroin and all that shit. And then they just, like. They were hardcore. Man. Yeah. But when we toured with them, it was funny because it was, like, no booze backstage. You know, it was, like, okay. You know. Thanks for watching To The Fullest with Jason Froberg. You can check out more podcasts here and subscribe by clicking right here. We air new podcasts every Monday morning on Space Brain Station and all of your favorite podcast apps.